Hey, what is going on, guys? I hope you're having a fantastic Sunday. We are going to have a lot of fun tonight. We got some great discussion. We got a great guest tonight. And somebody already mentioned it. It is our 100th podcast. So super pumped about that. We're going to have some fun tonight. Lots of stuff to talk about. I know Ryan is at Expona. He's tearing down the booth, so he won't be joining us tonight. But we got Jonathan here, of course, Rusty and Ivan. Welcome to the show, man. Hey, it's good to be on. I've been uh, dying to get on with you guys, so I'm excited about it. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. So Ivan is one of our VIP home theater experiences at M-Wave 2024. So we're going to hear from his story. We're going to talk about his home theater journey tonight. He'll talk about what he's got going on in his room. And and uh, so we're going to be excited about that. Um, we're also going to talk about a fun topic tonight based on a convert or I guess a comment that I got earlier this week. And so we'll hit that after we uh, go through Ivan's and that one is infectious elitist attitudes in home theater and kind of a, a subtitle. Do we really celebrate budget home theaters? And so I just think it's a, it's a cool conversation. So uh, we're going to have a lot of fun tonight. So we're literally going to dive into it. Say hi to some folks real quick. Theo, good to see you. Nicholas, SRW 1000, John's in the house. Chris, good to see you. One big chief. Yes, sir. 100 anniversary, not anniversary, but I guess episode. Uh, definitely Ryan is tired, I'm sure. Anytime you do a show, man, you are, are dying. Appreciate that, Brian. Lots of folks. Tyler, good to see you, man. See a lot of my patrons in here. That's awesome. Um, Yeah, no dancers tonight, Chris. I mean, unless one of these guys are going to. Got some kind of cake popping out. I'm all of danced it. out. Sorry. Nope, not gonna be me. <laughs> yeah. So we are we're excited, man. Um, oh, cool. So uh looks like Scott just had an opportunity. Did you go to the, the show to Axpona? Now um, I guess I, Jonathan, I thought you were gonna go this year. I didn't end up going. Okay. You kind of snuck up on me, and I just didn't I didn't end up going. I think one point y'all were trying to get a group to, to go. Okay. Yeah. I mean, when we've gone in the past, we've had a big group to get together and made it fun. You know, like a yeah. bunch of AVS form guys get together and meet each other and stuff. So that's been great, but I didn't okay. go this year. Ivan, can you adjust your mic just a tad down just a little bit? Yeah. You don't want to see my mic? <laughs> no, no, no. I think it was the volume. The Sorry. Oh, okay. it. Yeah. yeah. Ah. If you're able to, if not, no, yeah. no big deal. Let's see. Cool, man. But we're glad to see you guys. We're gonna, like I said, we're gonna have a blast tonight. So, um, just a real quick, anything going on in you guys' life this week? Well, today's my wife's birthday, so I'll give Ooh. her a shout out for that. Yeah, you better. Uh, You've been a doghouse. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so we had fun celebrating her and making her feel special, and awesome. got some uh, delicious barbecue for lunch. Mm, can't beat that, man. Yeah, There's a little after, after lunch barbecue. barbecue nap, meat hangover. What else? What do you guys do this week? Man, I had some excitement at church today. I was running the soundboard, and I yeah. usually don't like to do it when I'm on call, but they asked me to do it, so I said okay. Sure. So we are also supposed to be announced because we've been going to this church for a couple of years. We joined and signed up for a new member class and signed up, so we're new members. Right. So I was running the soundboard, supposed to go up to the stage for new member introduction. I get a call from work. I try to juggle like the call from work and technical support, <laughs> the soundboard, mm -hmm. and get ready to go up front. I was like, oh man, there's too much going on. I did mm -hmm. I've got one of the other guys to come over and help me. That's yeah. been my week, man. It's been on call week. It's been pretty, pretty busy. I love it. Hey Jonathan, is it okay if I ask what you do? I'm not sure. I don't even know. Sure. I work for the Federal Reserve Bank and I support an application. And we're not allowed to talk about the applications we support, but it mm -hmm. manages passwords. So nice. That's okay. effectively what we do. Top secret stuff, man. He well, told you. So were that. you part of this recent bank heist? I just I'm just curious. <laughs> Not at all. Because I want uh, you to confess right here, right now. Right on live. Jay, before you confess, <laughs> drop a few dollars in my account. <laughs> so Ivan, what about you, man? Anything exciting this week? Um, nothing terribly exciting. I'm in the car business. I work all the time. So um, this is exciting. I'm excited Ooh. to be on here. So um, I do have a birthday coming up in two weeks, though. So nice. that'll be fun. Heck yeah, man. So actually, I hit 100 subscribers on my channel this week. So fantastic. Nice. Brother. I'm excited about that. Fantastic. It's a grind, man. Uh, people it don't is. understand when you get on YouTube and you're constantly putting out videos, 
it's a grind. It's hard. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, all they do is hit hit record. Man, there's so much more to it for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My little 20 minute videos take about three hours to produce and yes. edit and everything. So yes. what's your channel name? I they don't, called, they don't uh, get it. Bible time with Ivan. Bible time with Ivan. Yep. Pull it up here. Okay. Yep. I, uh, so I had never read the Bible all the way through. I'll just tell you a quick story about it. I never yeah. read the Bible all the way through. I've been in church my whole life. Mm -hmm. Um, and about a year ago, a little over a year ago, I kept having this recurring dream that I needed to read the Bible, but I had to do it on YouTube and I had to start a YouTube channel about it. And I kept pushing it off and pushing off, pushing off and God would not let it go away from me. So here we are. I started it. And for me, it's just an accountability measure just to get through yeah. it. So sure. we're on day 107 right now. So that's awesome, bro. That's yeah. cool. We're right in the middle of first uh, Samuel. So Very anybody cool. wants to jump in and read the Bible with me. I'm that's taking this exciting, week off because I'm going on vacation, but I guess that's exciting too. I'm going to <laughs> the beaches of Alabama. There you go. I so, spent four years in Alabama. Yeah. Up in kind of the northeast. I think you're heading down on the south side. But yep, I'll be northeast. down in Orange Beach. Yep. I think that's all they have down there. Pretty much. Yeah. So my best friend's daughter is getting married on the beach. Cool. Yeah. Nice little getaway. Yeah. It's crazy how kid, how fast these kids grow. For sure. So I've been reviewing the um, Sofa Baton remote. Um, very surprised, to be honest with you. I'll share that in the, in the review and. I'm actually just doing a like a full on tutorial on it, how to do pretty much everything I know on it. But um, honestly, guys, like this is, I think it absolutely could be a contender to um, the Logitech Harmony lineup. Hmm. That's a pretty big deal. That's it is. Big. Yeah. Um, and like I said, it sat on my desk over here for probably over a month because I'm like, <laughs> I was just thinking back to my original experience with the X1. Right. And so I'm thinking X1S. Oh, What's that? I remember that. It wasn't good. No, it was buggy. It was, I don't know. It, it just, I think the bugs is what really just turned me off to it. And I didn't want to go through that again. And so I just told them up front, I'm like, look, if you send me something, it better be good because I'm not even going to bother doing a video. I don't mind telling people your remote stinks, but I'm not going <laughs> to waste my time doing, you know, I'm on day three of filming and editing, put it that way. Wow. I wouldn't spend that much time if I didn't see the value in this thing. Um, and I'll share in the video that it, there are a couple features that it doesn't have that Harmony has, um, but it's still a, even a little bit less expensive. I think Harmony Elite was about 250 and this one is one like 80. So, okay, you subtract those features. App seems really solid. Um, so, but anyway, hmm. that's coming out. I'll, I'll finish that tomorrow. And that'll be up up live on the channel at noon tomorrow. Now, is, time. is that their top of the line model? I think I know they've got like a U something. Um, honestly, I don't know. I don't know if there's any. I don't think there's anything higher than that. There was an older version, like a U something. I, I know they have the, a few. Yeah, I reviewed the X1. This is called the X1S. Um, but. A lot of stuff that I like stuff that I had issues with at the beginning, the bugs and the, it was mostly the hardware. I couldn't even connect to the hub at first. Um, and that that's just been really smooth. So I've even got some patrons that I reached out to them. I got on on the I think he's in the chat. Uh, Finster, Tyler, he's up in Canada and I knew he had it. And I said, hey, Tyler, um, I'm struggling with this, man. I, I cannot figure it out. And it was partially a me problem. It wasn't the software. I was just clicking on the wrong option, but we went through, we probably spent 30, 45 minutes just hanging out too. But, uh, but he helped me walk through it. Yeah. He said the X one S is the top of the line. The U two. Oh, okay. It's like $60. I got yeah. you. I okay. was looking at it, but it yeah. doesn't look like it doesn't have RF. It does not. So there's three main things. It doesn't, it doesn't have touchscreen. doesn't have RF. And it doesn't have a dock. So, but for the mm -hmm. most part, the rest is solid. Like, and some people don't want a dock. Some people don't care about RF. Like, I don't even need RF in my room. I never take the remote out of my room. All my equipment's in the room. So the hub and the little IR repeaters reach everything that I need. Um, so, but it's, 
Like I said, so, I, I'm I'm pleasantly surprised at how well it's done. So does it is it a Bluetooth connection from the remote to the hub, and then the hub shoots out IR to your devices? Yep. Okay. Because I I was thinking maybe it was um, Wi-Fi, but I came into my office here and mm -hmm. it wouldn't turn the volume down. Mm -hmm. I could do it outside the room, but I had to be pretty close to my room. Okay. So so it's it would still work inside of a cabinet because it's still so. wireless yeah. or correct or uh, radio. Bluetooth. It's just not yeah. RF. Yeah. Correct. So like you can stick it behind you. You don't have to be pointing it at a device. And then yeah. as long as you got that big IR sensor, if it doesn't reach something, like if you got a tall cabinet, they've got two IR repeaters on the back but one of them is even a double. So you actually get three repeaters. So they actually give you more. I think the mm -hmm. Harmony hub only has two IR repeaters. So, um, but yeah, like I said, it's going to be, it's probably even right now, it's about a 30 minute video, but I figure I'll do the review part up front. So if somebody just wants to know about the review, how does it work? Boom. They can just hit the first whatever. But then if they want a, a walk through how to, um, and I'll have timestamps on, and I'm, I'm literally, I'm trying to cover everything in the remote, how to set up, um, like a remote that doesn't, you know, it's not in their database. How do you program that? So I'm showing you how to do that, how to set up devices, how to set up activities, some kind of advanced stuff in there. So it should be pretty cool. So I'm excited about it, but yeah, so that'll be uploaded and out tomorrow. So let's just jump right into it. We're gonna have some fun. Um, Nicholas, I'm going to hit your topic when we get, uh, you'll be the first one once we get to um, the uh, the questions of the night, since that involves one of the questions. Well, Ivan, appreciate you being here. As we mentioned, if you're just joining us, Ivan, I'm the first time I think I met you in person was last year. Mm -hmm. um, we were at M-Wave. No, you, did you mm -hmm. come to first M-Wave? Uh, I did not come to the first M-Wave. First time I met you was at... Uh, was it Ryan's house? It was for the projector shootout. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> it was Funny the projector shootout there. at Ryan's house. So last year we're at M wave and the day before M wave, we have the home theater experiences and this is a VIP add on. So you don't have to do that. That's just something in addition, if you want more experience from M wave. So I'm going through these, I get a text message and it's like a video I'm like, and I didn't know who it was at first. And it was just a video and Ivan's talking and he's like, Hey, um, we're in the, you know, JTR room. And I'm like, this is awesome. Cause I can't be there. You know, it's like behind the scenes stuff. I said, Ivan, can I share this? He's like, absolutely, man. And you were just point of doing it, dude. He was feeding me left and right, and they were good videos. I'm like, oh, I stinking love it, love it, love it. Um, so that was super cool. So I appreciate that. But Ivan, this year, he's um, offered to open up his home. Um, Jonathan kind of worked out with all of them, and these are home theaters in the Kansas City area that are just truly spectacular. Like these are great experiences. So we've got eight of them this year. Ivan is one of them. Ivan, I'd love for you to share, first of all, maybe your home theater journey, just briefly. Um, how'd you get into the hobby? How far back does it go? And then we'll talk about your home theater as well, and then I'll pull up the website. Um, yeah, as we absolutely. Talk about that. So um, my personal journey in the home theater really probably started off um, probably about 2003, 2004, um, when I moved out of my dad's house was off at college. Um, I bought my first home theater in a box, which was a little Panasonic, the little itty bitty speakers. Yep. Um, and I thought I was hot stuff, man. And, and <laughs> I had, had it set up in my, in my little, uh, uh, townhouse and was loving it. And then I upgraded that to a Sony home theater in a box, which I actually mm -hmm. still have some of those speakers. They're right. a little bit bigger. Um, actually I have them up in the living room right now, still using those. Um, but I had that and, you know, was really enjoying that. And at the time I was working at Sears in the, in the appliance and, and electronics department. So I was getting these things pretty cheap. Um, kind of like when, when you were working at uh, circuit city, um, mm -hmm. you know, yep. you, you gotta love the discounts, right? Yes. Uh, get, get that open box when that came back, whatever. Um, 
so then I went to work at a uh, it was a local it's in a, just an appliance store now, uh, but at the time they had a an actual home theater division um, mm-hmm. where they were working with custom builders and everything going in and building these home theaters. Um, and there's these two brothers in town that own about half of the price choppers uh, here in town, and we did their home theaters, and I fell in love. Now. Mm-hmm. I knew I would never get to their level of home theater because, you know, they got way more money than I do. But that's when I really got a passion for it. But my circumstances and everything at the time didn't allow for it. Sure. Um, and then this is a funny story. I was married at the time. I We were sitting down to watch the first Tron that came out. Mm-hmm. And my subwoofer went out. And I look <laughs> over at my wife and I said, hey, they've got the same subwoofer at Best Buy. Right. I can run over there and pick it up real quick. It was like 730. So I knew they were going to be closed. And I get there and they are blasting um, Dirty Bit in the back of the store on these clip speakers. And I texted texted the wife and says, hey, can I? She says, if you can get them home. And I had a little two-door Grand Am at the time. Right. And I sent her a picture. I said, hey, if I can get these home, can I get them? She's like, in her mind, they're not going to fit in the car. Yeah, she's like, you better oh, believe yeah. I jammed those towers and I still have you them. them to the top, right? Man, I, to. I've never squeezed so much stuff in the back of that Grand Am, awesome. but I got those two speakers, the center channel, and uh, a Yamaha, uh, uh, the Yamaha receiver. All of that mm-hmm. is still up in the in the uh, living room, and those are probably twenty years old now. Yeah, um, but. That's really kind of what started it. And then I bought this house two and a half years ago. Mm-hmm. And the reason I bought this house was for this mm-hmm. room that I'm sitting in. Nice. These chairs actually came with the house, but he didn't have anything near the level of what I have. But I saw this room and I had the vision. I was like, whatever it takes, I'm getting that house. <laughs> so, and this was in the middle of houses going stupid. And I made sure. a stupid offer and <laughs> I got a, I got the house. So, but this is, this is the reason I bought this house is for this room right here, because all of those dreams I had from building everybody else's home theaters over the years yeah. were going to come together in this room. So it's, this is where the journey has brought me. So, um, and I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to share it with people. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to have as many people as I can fit in this room during M Wave, yes. um, and I'm excited to have everybody here. So, well, that's awesome. Um, well, so we're gonna we'll go over like your equipment and stuff just yeah. to share. But tell us what we're looking at right here. So actually, this is exactly what I'm looking at right now. Um, I've got the um, 120 inch uh, screen with I'm probably one of the few people that has an ultra short, short throw. Um, I've got, I got to pull it up just to remember all the model numbers. I got it pulled up on my mm-hmm. phone. Um, that is the, uh, uh da, 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 where'd it go? LS 500. That's it. The, the Epson, uh, LS 500, um, which has a, a beautiful, uh, image. It's, you know, it's not a, uh, JVC NX nine or anything, but for, I think I paid three grand for the projector and screen at the time. That's awesome. Um, and now you can get, I was thinking about upgrading to the new uh, 800, mm-hmm. but I don't know that it's enough nicer to make me want to, to upgrade, but sure, it's uh, a beautiful image. Um, absolutely love it. Um, people come down here and they're blown away. I just had my girlfriend and her two daughters, my daughter down here last night watching the Batman right. and it was fantastic. So, and that's what it's all about. Just sharing it with my friends and family and enjoying, enjoying the movies and stuff. Hundred um, percent. You really can't see them in that picture, but I do have the uh, the Revel F F two hundred eight. They gotta love the velvet. They all blend in up there. Um, and in the picture is the C two hundred five, because this is a fun story. And if anybody is here in Kansas City, if you're not buying from Ryan. Go see my guy um, at Nebraska <laughs> Furniture Mark Thomas because he is taking care of me and gotten me through this <laughs> this journey of getting the oh, center man. channel right. Um, so I had that C205, which you see in the image, you see the two wides, which are the uh, F36s, mm-hmm. which is what I started with in this room. That's right. And here. then I upgraded the, to the F208s um, and moved the F, F36s to my wides. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I had the C208, which 
went out. It blew at least two of the drivers in it, and I have no idea how it happened. Um, I'm thinking Rebel may have been having issues with that speaker because it has been on back order for months now. Just and that's the only speaker they have that's on back order. So um, my I heard guy, a rumor I, that they were cutting that, they were killing that line off, and I don't know they, if they were. Well, that yeah. could be why I can't get a replacement. So yeah, um, Revel and Ryan actually helped start this process. So I owe Ryan everything for <laughs> causing me to spend more money because, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, like I said, the two hundred eight has been on back order. It was supposed to be in in December. And it's still not in. So uh, my guy at home at the Nebraska Furniture Mart was like, hey, I can get you a crazy good deal on the C426BE, which is their top of the line center mm -hmm. channel. It's got their beryllium and everything in it. Um, normally like a $5,000 speaker. And when all said and done with the credit from the 208 and everything, I'm getting it way, way cheaper. I've been told not to say what I'm paying for that speaker, right. but it's not much of an upgrade from what I had invested in the 208. So mm -hmm. I know what he's doing because now I'm going to have to upgrade the other two <laughs> other two right. speakers at some point. So, um, but yeah, so I'm excited to hear that once it comes in. It's supposed to be in next week, so um, that'll be exciting. But uh, let's see, where did I leave off? Oh, I got the uh, um, my Atmos speakers are the um, M16s. I've got mm -hmm. four M16s up above. And then my uh, surround uh, left and right and the rears are also the, the 16s. So all Rebel. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, just went to uh, Best Buy and listened to a bunch of speakers. Went to Nebraska Furniture Mart, listened to a bunch of speakers. And I fell in love with the Rebels from the very beginning. And absolutely. Oh, here's a closer picture right hey, here. I'm, yeah, I'm with you. I have the exact same Revel F two hundred eight and C two hundred eight in my living room, and that yeah. was they were my dedicated home theater speakers before that. I love them. I mean, like I don't think it's it's tough to beat, for, especially for the price. Yeah, great, yeah, great those, speaker. Those two hundred eights aren't terribly expensive. Um, yeah, there you go. You can see them right there. And then uh, I've got the three uh, SB sixteens uh, mm -hmm. for uh, subs in here. So. Uh, currently, the way I have it set up is the um, 934. Uh, I can not switch it in the receiver to the 736 because I do have uh, center Atmos as well. You can see those two white dots. Those are my center Atmos. Okay. I'll paint them black at some point. <laughs> yeah. I see. Um, so I can run it either way, but I prefer the wides over having the, the six Atmos. Yeah. And you got a sweet little multi-purpose room here too. So you got a little bar, fireplace, yeah, bar, here. fireplace. Nice. It's, it's I, I really like it down here. Um, when I first started, there was no carpet down here, so it was a huge echo chamber. So that was a room treatment, room treatment, room treatment, room treatment. Mm -hmm. I can't yeah. say that enough. It makes all the difference. Nice. Yeah, a lot of people, you know, myself included, I did that at the end. Mm -hmm. And I wish I would have did that at the beginning, you know, because my room had such a nasty slap echo and it really hindered the, I guess, the clarity and the resolution of the system. Yeah, it was a uh, turn the AC off real quick because it's loud. Um, but yeah, that's the same thing I was dealing with was was that slap echo. I put the carpet mm -hmm. in about a year after I moved in. So I've only had the carpet about a year, um, but I had the GIK acoustic panels. Yeah. Um I didn't realize how easy it is to build acoustic panels or else I probably wouldn't have spent the money on the GIKs. Right. <laughs> um, so uh, if you go back to that picture of the ceiling, you can see the, sure the DIY there. ones I built. Um, uh, one before that, uh, that one. So oh, those three at the top, I built those myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I built about 60 <laughs> of them for my church. Um, so you had some practice, man. Yeah. Yeah, they're not. they're really not that hard to do. So and there's plenty of videos on YouTube on how to do it. So yeah, it's a uh, it's fun. It's it's a journey. <laughs> you got a gorgeous setup, dude. So let me go to here because we didn't oh, talk yeah. about the rack here. So what are you running in your rack? So I've got the Marantz eighty eight oh five A for the processor, um, the two Panamax uh, power conditioners. Don't mm -hmm. know if they really do anything. They're just 
I like him because they they turn on and off with the uh, with sure. the remote control with the mm-hmm. um through the Morants. Mm-hmm. So literally, we were just talking about the remote. I love my Apple TV because I can do everything through it. Okay, mm-hmm. it makes life easy. I have this, and then I have the remote for the DVD player if I'm using that. But literally mm-hmm. everything I can do through the Apple TV remote. Nice. Um, so of course, I have the Apple TV in there. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got the three monolith. Um, I've got the three uh, X by two hundred. Okay. And I've got the seven by two hundred and a five by two hundred. Right. Um, and they're solid amps. I've not had any issues bucks. with them. Um, and they are a true two hundred watts per channel, yeah. all channels driven, which is what what I really liked about it. Yeah. Um, and then I've got the Panasonic DVD player. I think that about covers it. Uh, are you still know. streaming Tidal? Or are you doing? Are you switching over to Am- Apple's music? Uh, I'm streaming now? almost everything on a- on uh, Apple Music down here. Um, you remember when we had that conversation about the the title and the the Apple Music and the difference? Played a lot and, quieter on Tidal. Yeah, that the title was. I think we measured about <laughs> 15 dB quieter. Yeah, pretty significant. Yeah, so I don't do anything on Tidal um, down here. I'm all exclusive Apple Apple Music down here. Um, if I'm not down here, I actually use YouTube, YouTube music in my truck and everything else, but um, because YouTube music doesn't have the spatial audio yet, so pretty much all uh, all Apple music down here. So, which actually my girlfriend just yesterday said that we need to have another music listening session down here. She I there did go. that one night and she absolutely loves it. The 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 Atmos music and everything it, it oh, it's yeah. a game changer. Yeah. I agree, hundred percent. So Ivan, I'm also looking here. So you have um, Butt Kicker Advance installed in your, in your seat. That right? was a youth man deal. <laughs> that was a youth man deal. I got all of, all uh, eight of my butt kickers I got from Ryan um, out of that uh, bunch that Jonathan, you were a part of that. Yeah, they had um, a ton of them. The <laughs> the that bunch that you guys got, and then when you yeah, took we got a couple out, hundred of them from a cinema yeah. that was decommissioning. Yep. So that's where all eight of these came from. I went through, lubed them all back up, and they've been rock solid. I had to lubricate one of mine again this week because one of them started misbehaving. Have you had to rehit any of them with like white lithium grease or anything? Um, I did all eight of them when I first put them in, and that's been not quite a year ago, so I haven't had any issues with them since then. I, I just went through and did them all before I installed them because I knew they'd they had been used a little bit. So sure, I did them all when I installed them, but it's probably been my mind were from the very beginning, and only one of them. It was just that it was like not hitting as hard as the others. My daughter was kind of moving seats and she's like, this seat isn't hitting as hard as the others. So I went, we tested after the movie and sure enough, put the grease on it. And now it's just back to normal. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't seem like it takes it, but just to keep in mind, you might have to yeah. do it again in a few years. I'll keep that in mind. So, and then I'm running, um, what amps do I have on there? So you've got, oh, uh, uh, I don't think you put the amps. A Behringer NX. Behringer NX. Yeah. Uh, NX 10,000. Yep. So I've got two of those on there. No, just one of those. Um, I That's might do a know. second one, though. Wait a minute. You're running eight of those butt kickers off one NX-1000? Yeah. Wow. Is that 1,000 or a 10,000? 10,000. I don't think they make a 10,000 unless you guys know something I don't know. I okay. think it's a 1,000, a 3,000, a 6,000. Okay, if they make a 10,000, I'll buy one. Yeah. <laughs> because I want one like that. But I don't. Well, yeah, I'm running all eight of them off of one. Wow. What... I'm surprised you, I mean, those things will take like a legit 300 watts each. And if you got yeah. eight of them, you're looking at quite a bit more than that Behringer will do. But I mean, if you're happy with it, I, I was over there. I liked your theater an awful lot and I thought it felt great. So I can't, I'm, I guess I'm surprised it does it is all it's it felt great. So based off of the di- diagram on, um, butt kickers website, I think mm-hmm. they're getting, According to that, the way they're wired, they should be getting 200 watts each, according to the diagram on, on their website. So those so, are those particular butt kickers you have are three ohms instead mm-hmm. of four because they're a commercial version. Mm-hmm. So well, that could be changed. You get a little bit. You get a little bit more power than if they yep. were four ohms, like the consumer version. But that, See, that, that. then NX1000 should really only be putting about 600 watts per channel, like tops. So you got mm-hmm. four on each one, basically. Mm-hmm. Four on each channel. Yep. Man, I mean, you're probably you're probably you're probably looking at maybe you're putting 150 watts into each one of those. So if you want more shake, 
you can get quite a bit more shake. And I'll also say this. I played with a I played with the NX three thousand on my butt kickers. Mm-hmm. The same exact units you have, of course, because we came from the same place. And I and I noticed the old iron amps. Now I'm not one that believes that amps tell a little difference, you know, like as far as sound quality or whatever when I'm running the subwoofers, but I can tell you for sure that the NX series I have a theory about why. But the NX series won't power those butt kickers as strong as like an old iron amp, like the old heavy duty with the transformer in them and so forth. I remember you saying that before. Yeah. I mean, so so just so you know, if you want more headroom on those butt kickers, if you want to shake yourself out of the chair, you can See, do this it. This is the problem with this podcast, man. <laughs> this is the problem with hanging out with Jonathan. <laughs> the journey never ends. Jonathan's yeah. a pusher. It's not just a subjective thing where I'm getting snake oil stuff. I tested it like how far it bounces off the carpet when you're playing bass. I love you with that five hertz mm-hmm. note. Right. And the the old Crown XLS series, like the old heavy duty amps, mm-hmm. the, yep. the darn butt kicker would jump off the carpet, like literally wow. jump off the carpet. And with the butt kicker or with the NX series, it would not. It it yeah. it may actually made it sound like it was bottoming out before it would jump off the carpet. And the and the amps should have been comparable power. So so just to say, yeah. like I I know butt kickers can go actually absolutely crazy you might not even want that but if you You'll do kind of rip your chairs apart if you yeah want you can you can put a lot more to them if you want to I've, i have considered either adding a second uh behringer amp or upgrading to one of the other ones mm-hmm. um just because like when something digs real deep they're great i feel them mm-hmm. they're fantastic it's mm-hmm. you know more of the the lighter stuff mm-hmm. that i don't really feel them as much so mm-hmm. um I don't know. You'll have to come over. We'll have to play with it and see. I got a lot of things to talk to you about that subject. We'll have to. We'll have to link up afterwards. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I do. I agree. One hundred percent. The butt kickers do the real violent shaking well, mm-hmm. and you can tone them down to where it's not real violent, but it's still like a real heavy duty. Like your chair gets moving pretty good. But yep. the time alignment is a beautiful thing. But they don't do like a subtle. At least I haven't figured out how to do it, and I've played with an awful lot. I haven't figured out how to do like a subtle, like guitar string feel, like an acoustic right. energy, like a yeah. real subtle feel. They don't seem to, they, they, they have like a threshold to activate. And until you hit that threshold, there's nothing. And then they'll activate and they'll activate pretty hard. And it's, you know, like mm-hmm. a butt kicker advance, like a one pound slug. So when it gets moving, it gets moving. Yeah. A subwoofer driver is measured in like, you know, grams basically, like how much the moving mass is much, much less weight. And mm-hmm. so uh, I don't want to steal your thunder or anything, but what I'm saying is, if you want it, you said you're after that like acoustic energy feel or kind of more mm-hmm. subtle feel. I think you got to go near field or you got to do like a direct attached driver to get to complement the two together. Are fantastic. But to complement that, that violence that the butt kicker has with the subtle subtlety that the acoustic energy has the other, the subwoofer drivers are the way to do that. Okay. I will have to talk more on that. Cause I can give you some guidance on that. Yeah. And you can get me to, you can come over and help me move this pole. <laughs> I, don't want to do that. Oh, I think Jonathan is done with that. Yeah, yeah I, I just moved my pole. That pole right there. <laughs> where do you want to move it? I just wanted either to the left of foot or to the front of foot. That way I can bring the. I would love to move this seat, this row of seats forward mm-hmm. a couple feet so I could do some near field. Yeah. Well, so, I can tell you, I can give you guidance on that, but it's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nah. big project. I, I don't. Sure. I don't know that that's in the in the works ever. <laughs> Ivan, are you using the Behringer DSP for the butt kickers? Um, I have some. Yes, I'm using that. I know. I've toyed with um, wanting to run it through the mini DSP. Um, I just need to get uh, Jonathan or Ryan's expertise mm-hmm. on on doing that mm-hmm. part. We'll have to do it before M Wave. Let's yeah. figure out a date. Oh, well, on once now. I once I get this new center okay. channel in, I'm gonna start retuning everything anyway. So, when can... I was over there, I thought your stuff was integrated real nicely. So there, I'm not. Mm-hmm. Don't take it any other way than that. I thought it was integrated real nicely. Like your buckers did a great job. I think I, I, I think really they're aligned really well. Um, I don't notice any any separation from the subs and the butt kickers or anything. Mm-hmm. They're they're not distracting at all. So. They don't draw attention right. to themselves. No. That's what you want. You right. want it to be seamless. Well, I love it, man. I, I, I mean, saw you, here. Oh, Scott said that he's actually going to be at your uh, VIP home theater experience. So he's looking excellent. forward to it. So I, I absolutely love it. Like I said, the, I'm super pleased with the Revels. Um, like I said, I don't, I don't, I've heard Jonathan's room. I've heard Ryan's room before you tore it up. I've heard all the everything. Um, I don't 
really, I love those rooms, but I don't need the extra base. I don't need the extra stuff. This is perfect for what I use it for. Yeah. Well, I so think it's great, man. So if I, get a, if I need a fix, I'll just go over to Jonathan or Ryan's or, <laughs> or the other Ryan's or whoever's house that has monster subs and everything. Yeah, for sure. Those Rebels are on sale for nineteen twenty-five each right now. It's a good deal because they're normally twenty-seven fifty, and they are discontinuing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're I, they are phenomenal speakers. I absolutely love them. Um, the tonality of them is great. The clarity, they're not too bright. Not you know, they're they're mm -hmm. they're pretty great neutral. For listening to music and they're great for watching movies. Um, I absolutely love them. I will say there is a stark difference between the C two hundred five and the C two hundred eight. So I'm excited mm -hmm. to get this this other one in here, the, nice. the Brillium. See what it's going to sound like. Cause I've never heard those. So, right. You talked like a little bit about the your room treatment and how big a difference it made. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit about like how you went about designing that and why you picked what you did? Like, what was your thought process behind it? So when I first moved into this house and I first set everything up. It was concrete floors, um, mm -hmm. pretty concrete floors. They were stained and everything, so they looked mm -hmm. nice. But for acoustics, they were terrible. So first thing I did actually was get the the sound panels because it had completely flat drywall in here as well. Um, and this was before I started figuring out the DIY stuff and, and the budget and everything, which mm -hmm. um, at the time, budget was a little bit uh, – Little, little bit better than what it <laughs> became later. Car business is very, very fluctuating um, sure. in the last mm -hmm. couple of years. So um, while the getting was good, I got the GIK acoustic panels um, and I was watching. Um, oh God, what is his name? Uh, I can't remember his name on YouTube. Um, Anthony Grimani, Matthew Pose. No. <laughs> It'll come to me in a minute. He he does uh, a lot of how-to videos mm -hmm. on uh, different things. Why can't I think of his name right now? Um, it'll come to me when we finish this podcast. I know, um, but he was talking about how to you know align acoustic panels, and you know, I just did the the mirror the mirror on the wall to figure out mm -hmm. first reflections mm -hmm. and everything, and figured out kind of what I needed. And then the back wall is just strictly, you know, how it looked. You know, aesthetics, aesthetics, and everything. So, I get big here. Um, got my Chiefs flags back there. Um, oh, but yeah. I've got uh, the two, four, eight, eight GIK panels in here. Mm -hmm. um, so, I went with that off all the first reflections. And then um, I kept hearing about the reflections off the ceilings and how much it would clear up the, um, the vocals in movies and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's about when I started figuring out how to do the DIY sound panels. And so, I built um, I've got four DIY panels in here as well. Um, mm -hmm. I stole three and put up in my studio um, for my podcast, so it sounds better. Home Theater Guru, that's exactly who it was. Thank you. See, the chat um, is good, man. They're helping. I love these guys. They're fantastic. <laughs> They're on top of it. Um, but uh, so I did that. My chat keeps getting behind. It won't stay up to date. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> oh, that's why. Huh. You got to teach me how to use this software, man. I don't it's all know good, man. <laughs> all good. Um, yeah, if you scroll up, it'll stay. But if you scroll to the bottom, yep. it'll keep going. Um, so, yeah, I did that. And then I was like, man, these floors got to go. Actually, a, an incident happened where I had a bunch of guys over here watching the Chiefs game. Mm -hmm. And somebody slipped and fell. And I don't know what he hit, but it killed everything. So we missed like 10 minutes of the Chiefs yeah. game. So I was like, okay, it's time for some carpet. Mm -hmm. um, so that's when I went with the uh, kind of movie theater style carpet. Mm -hmm. um, if I had to do it again, I'd probably go all black carpet just because you can still, the pattern can still distract me a little bit while I'm watching movies. Sure. Uh, painted the ceiling black, but the, the acoustics, the acoustic panels made all the difference in the world. Um, definitely, definitely. If you haven't done acoustic panels, um, nothing against GIK because they're fantastic panels. Um, but there's definitely cheaper ways to do it. Yeah. yeah um, I think there. I've got 15 bucks of each into one of these panels. So, so yeah, it's given hard, it's hard to beat the DIY for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything that you would do differently knowing what you know now? 
Um, I probably would have started with the 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 Room treatment training. first. Mm -hmm. That would have been done a lot earlier in the process. Um, I would have enjoyed that first year of everything a lot more, yeah. uh, just because. I mean, it sounded great. There's plenty of audio, plenty of volume, uh, which a lot of people, that's what they're looking for. When friends and stuff come over, that's what they're enjoying. They don't pick out the intricacies that mm -hmm. us that have been doing this for, you know, 10 years or whatever mm -hmm. that we can pick out. But um, I would have done that sooner. I would have done the velvet around the screen sooner because um, that has made a huge difference um, visually on the screen. Mm -hmm. Um, I think everybody in Kansas City keeps buying, buying up all the velvet from um, <laughs> Joanne because every time I go in there, somebody yeah. just came in and, and it's always a guy. They said some guy they just came in out. and bought up all the velvet. That's <laughs> so funny. It's got to be somebody in our in our group that keeps buying up all the velvet at Joanne's. So. It's probably Bill making his music room. Remember him, Michael? Yes, um, I do. He bought up Bill. all the velvet. <laughs> that that was room. Bill's theater was the first kind of black hole I've ever experienced. Holy I mean, black. He had velvet on everything. Top to yeah. bottom, left to right. It was crazy. The Even over his speakers. <laughs> yes. I've got velvet yeah. on my speakers. Uh, the, the two subs up front have velvet on them because mm -hmm. the, the, it was reflecting off of them. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, that's uh, that's probably would have been the first thing. Mm -hmm. um, I might have saved up a little bit more and gone with the, with the F208 first because um, there was definitely a stark difference between the 36s and the 208s. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I ended up repurposing the 36s, so they're still in here. Yeah. And you mentioned also that uh, you're, you're thinking of upgrading your uh, projector. Was there anything else that you have planned or on the, the, the bucket list, the um, dream list? At one point, I was considering um, adding front heights um, and mm -hmm. doing a – uh, center height and the two front heights. It's actually already wired for it because when I first started, um, I was listening to uh, Chana and those guys. You know, they were all on the the Oro 3D kick and the hybrid system. So I actually had the my front Atmos were mounted right next to the screen. Um, so I still have wires there. So I considered putting speakers there, but that would require a lot larger investment in a processor. Yeah, you'd have to um, either go into the storm right? or or something like that. It would probably be a storm just because I know a guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks, Ryan. Uh, but that's a that's a much larger investment that mm -hmm. I don't know if it would make that big of a difference for me to justify it. Yeah. Did you try front heights at all or just wire for it? Like did you actually have I had I, I had them up there initially, um, mm -hmm. and then there was just such a big gap in from the fronts to the back um that I wasn't really feeling anything overhead mm -hmm. um so that was that's why i moved them to where they are now i found some some mounts and had to drill some holes in some speakers but it's fine <laughs> when i tried front heights i had the same experience i was like yeah i think i can tell they're on and then i'd watch the clip turning them off and i was like they still sounds the same i can't right. tell the difference so, so i'm with you there yeah i definitely Actually. prefer the the true atmos setup versus the hybrid Oro and there's not like we have a lot of Oro stuff out there, anyways. Um, the Marantz does actually a really good job up mixing the Oro 3D, but mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I prefer the the Atmos setup that I currently have. I think so. Um, and like I said, I went from the center Atmos to the wides, um, just because I, I I noticed that gap a lot bigger just because of the way my room is set up, mm -hmm. more so than the gap between. The, the atmos speakers so so and you can see the atmos speakers right here god this is weird everything's backwards you can see that's an atmos speaker right there above the gik panel right, right there and then the other one's right over here right above that chief's ah god everything is backwards <laughs> <laughs> that one right there is the other uh, yard. that's so, funny yeah it's people mirror, in mirror. the back back row don't catch a lot of the the rear atmos but mm -hmm. for here Right. It's, this is the money seat. I'm sitting That's in the, the money way mine seat. Right is. The rear one, the rear seats are right up against the wall, so they yeah. kind of miss out. But I didn't build it for them. You know, if right. I had a bigger room, <laughs> it, it would work, but so, it just doesn't. You know, like, like I said, I've considered moving this row forward and then mm -hmm. bringing those off the wall a little bit, but yeah, 90% of the time, it's me and my girlfriend down here or me and whoever. 
anytime the back seats are being used, it's when my daughter and her friends are down here and they don't care. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Well, I am super grateful that you have opened up your home for the folks that are coming to M wave. Um, if you're interested in checking out his home theater. So let me put this up here and go to uh, Midwest. I'm sorry. Yeah. Midwest AV experience.com. And then up at the top, just go to attend and then home theater experiences. We've got eight home theater experiences this year. Um, just some really phenomenal, very well designed. Uh, all of them are totally unique, totally different, different speakers, different room layout, different configuration, different subwoofers. Some have tactile transducers, some have uh, near field subwoofers. So it's a different experience for each one of them. But we're super grateful that Ivan's opened up his home. So all the information on the website, you can check that out. List of his equipment. So he's got eight theater seats. So we're only going to do eight uh, during the AM. So that would be the 9 to 11.30 time slot. Then he'll have eight different people at 12.30 to 3 p.m. And then he'll have an early evening from 4 p.m. to 6.30. So if you're interested in uh, checking out that system, the day before M-Wave starts, which is the Thursday, June the 20th, you can check that out on the website. And I may smoke some chicken wings or something too. Who knows? Oh no, he did not. <laughs> oh my goodness, man. You guys I've, are getting hooked up. Jonathan, I've got two smokers out ready? back. Who knows? Who knows what, <laughs> like, who knows what I'll cook up? That's my other hobby. Man, I've man, got too many man. expensive hobbies. <laughs> I love it, dude. So, so Michael, how can, uh, how can people go see this theater maybe for free? So here's the cool thing. So we have come up with due to some gracious people. Um, we actually have a contest going on right now and you only have three more days. Wednesday at midnight is your deadline. You can go to MidwestAVExperience.com, go to the contest page. So you can either type it in just like that or on the home page. there's an option. All the details are there. I've got a video there explaining it, but the gist of it is submit a 90 second or less video. We're not looking for production. You don't have to have lights. Use your phone. I don't even care if you do it horizontal or vertical, doesn't matter. Share with us your home theater journey. Not quite as extensive as Ivan did because um, we don't have 45 minutes, but we got 90 <laughs> seconds. Tell us your, your journey. Like how did you get into it? Um, and also why do you want to come to M-Wave? What do you hope to get out of M-Wave and an incredible home theater experience like Ivan's? Um, and we're going to select one winner and that winner is going to get one general admission ticket and you're going to get, three VIP home theater experiences. So super excited for one of you guys. Um, it, it can't get any easier than that. I mean, my goodness, man, <laughs> just grab your phone. You don't even need to edit the video. Just hit record, share those two things. All the details are on the website, um, but we would love to have you join us for M-Wave 2024. It's our third year doing it. Um, so we are excited. So well, before we transition into uh, the question for tonight, uh, definitely want to give a big thanks to our podcast sponsor, Ascend AV. Some of you guys were asking, hey, where's Ryan tonight? He is at Expona. I believe, did they wrap up today? Like, Yeah, I think he's I think he's packing tonight. Yeah. Is what he, he said he's not going to be able to join because he's packing up. Yeah, I've been seeing a lot of people post online on Facebook as well as um, Instagram. And um, so, yeah, so... Definitely check out the content that's out there on YouTube on some of the folks that have been to Axpona this year. I'm sure it was a great event, but I know he's packing up and he's ready to get back home, man. So he was not able to join us tonight. So he had his own room, right? Didn't I mean that's what the pictures he was sitting in it looked like. Yeah. I didn't hear much in advance of his plans, but yeah. So he was doing um, I think Martin Logan bookshelf speakers. I don't know what subwoofers he was running in there, but um I think I'm wanting to say Bob was even helping him out with his room. Is that correct? I, yes, mm -hmm. he did mention Bob was there with mm -hmm. him. Yeah. So the hard part with a, with a show like that is you literally don't leave the room, you know, mm -hmm. for the most part, because there, there's no break. There's no, Hey, we're going to shut the door for, you know, an hour for lunch. It's like you either brought some lunch or you have somebody bring lunch to you. So I know he's exhausted. So hopefully he'll have a safe flight home and get some much needed rest after Axpona. So tonight's topic, this is going to be super, super fun. And then we'll probably, we'll do questions at the end, 
but um, honestly, I'm not going to star like a bunch of them because I don't want to uh, keep these guys on here all night long. Um, but the topic tonight is infectious elitist attitudes in home theater. And where this is coming from, and, and then I have a subtitle, Do We Really Celebrate Budget Home Theaters? And where this idea came from is I had, I read a ton of comments, guys. I read as many comments as I possibly can on my channel. You'll see on every, I've got a hundred and what, 90 videos on my channel. And I comment on every single video. Now I can't comment on every single comment because that's just thousands and thousands and thousands. I wouldn't be able to make any videos for you guys. But I do my best to, to at least read them. Usually I'll give you a thumbs up or a heart just to let you know I read it. But even then I can't physically read all of them. But I read a lot. Um, but this one came up and it was just interesting. And so I want to preface this. I'm not um, like, I don't even want to say like poking fun or um, I just thought it was an interesting take and interesting observation of home theater, the space, YouTube, and possibly even my channel and what we do here on the podcast. So I just thought it'd be a good conversation. So I'm going to read this comment here and then we'll have some discussion around it. So high fine is 343. Uh, I think this was sometime last week that he posted this. He says, one thing that may have, uh, maybe having people spend their hobby money elsewhere is the infectious elitist attitudes in the forums and chats. I know this exists in all hobbies, but it's particularly distasteful in home theater. If you don't have single digit frequency response, a fully treated family room with multiple 18 inch subwoofers and a 10,000 uh, lumen projector, your system won't be celebrated. That deters buyers in a down economy more than the cost of entry does. Even the quote, enjoy your journey message. So that is something that, that I share on this channel a lot. And actually, give me one second. Ivan, I didn't realize I was hiding your face there, brother. <laughs> um, so I share that, that, that phrase, enjoy your journey. And so he says, even the enjoy your journey message implies that you haven't reached end game and you probably won't. So just be content with what you have. Social media makes it really hard to enjoy what you have when the poisonous comments don't allow you to celebrate your expressed hard work, true in any hobby and in any walk of life, but particularly negative in home theater. And so there are definitely parts of this that, that I absolutely see in the home theater space. We do see some people that choose to belittle someone that post you know, their home theater, maybe in a Facebook group or in a forum or um, even on a Discord server. And sometimes people will take jabs at it because maybe they aren't where the other person that's making the replies, you know, they're not at their, you know, where they're at in their journey. And I know Ivan, you know, I asked him backstage, I'm like, Ivan, you got an incredible home theater, but I bet you didn't build that thing in like six months, did you? No. So this has been a long, multi, probably decade journey. Mm -hmm. And same thing with Jonathan. I guarantee the same thing with Rusty. And I know me, you know, I've been on my home theater journey just in this house for 18 years. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes people look at, you know, the things that I share on my channel and they may make a comment like, oh, Michael, your, um, your channel isn't the same as it used to be. You're, you're now talking about kaleidoscape you're now talking about mad vr you're talking about uh an, an nz8 projector and and that's not you know budget friendly and, and you don't celebrate you know us little guys or us that don't have that type of budget and there could be nothing farther from the truth you look at the things that i review on my channel the home theater tours that i do i've done the million dollar um home theater you know that was a star wars home theater I've done some that are kind of in the middle, you know, and I've done some real, I mean, we're talking super crazy budget home theaters. I've celebrated it all. Same thing with, with reviews. I review some expensive, uh, I think there were $12,000 speakers from, um, uh, oh my goodness, Sonus Faber, beautiful home speaker, home theater speakers and two channel speakers. I've done some expensive reviews and videos on Mad VR and, and um, uh, 
Kaleidoscape and others. I've also done some super budget friendly stuff like ELAC. I've done SVS and Klipsch and um, man, a whole host of, of things that even that aren't necessarily budget, but they're certainly attainable. And especially when you're talking about what we're talking about is over time. This doesn't happen overnight. And so it's easy to look at, at what we recommend here on the, on the podcast when we're talking about, I know JTR comes up a lot. And the reality is I know that not everybody is going to be able to spend four grand on a subwoofer. That's a lot of money. It really, really is. And I totally understand that. But I don't, I don't look at Ivan and go, man, Ivan, you only got SVS. That's terrible. That system rocks. I, I haven't even mm -hmm. been, I haven't experienced it myself, but I've heard and I've reviewed a bunch of different SVS. And I think all except for the little micro impressed me, you know, and the micro, it just, it's not meant to be in a home theater. It's meant to be in like an office or a small space. Um, but the reality is there's so many different brands and so many different uh, models that you can get in a home theater that won't absolutely break the bank. And so I'm going to kind of open it up to you guys on some of the thoughts here. And maybe I'll just put this back up here. Is there anything that kind of stands out in this conversation that that you'd like to maybe talk about or, or address? You know, for me, you know, the, the, the journey is part of the hobby, you mm -hmm. know, for me as a home theater hobbyist, yeah. um, and I consider myself that if you're not on the journey and not looking to constantly tweak something or constantly improve something, I'm not near the level of, you know, tweaking mm -hmm. stuff as a Jonathan or a Ryan or, you know, some of the other guys, but just like the center channel fiasco that I've been on, it's probably yeah. going to cause me to upgrade the, the, <laughs> the rest of the LCRs to match yeah. them. Um, yeah. So is there ever an end game? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, for me, that would probably be about where that end game is would probably be with those, the, the next set of rebels I get. Mm -hmm. I don't really need the JTR subs. I don't want to rip my house apart. You know, mm -hmm. these SBS subs are plenty great for me. So, yeah, yeah. But that SBS system they had at M Wave last year, <laughs> I think it was a five thousand dollar system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, total or less. That thing rocked. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can absolutely do home theater on a budget and have a really, really kick ass system. Yeah. So. And I love oh, guys. That's, like, the, that's my thoughts on it. I love Craig. He's saying like, man, I've been on this journey forty stinking years. You know, twenty. 23 years just in home theater you know i've always been on a budget and have really enjoyed the journey especially as of late and i think that's phenomenal and that's i believe that all of us here on this podcast do celebrate wherever you're at you know mm -hmm. if you've got a home theater in a box dude rock it out now more than likely if you're a true enthusiast you probably won't stay there forever mm -hmm. At some point, you're going to want a bigger subwoofer because you're going to go to somebody's house like Ivan's and go, holy cow, I'm missing out on some fun. And then you're going to go to somebody else's house and go, oh, my goodness, man. Whether it's, a, you know, um, the near field subwoofers and Ivan didn't have that. And you're like, well, I want some of that at my house, yes. you know, and then you go to Rusty's house and he's got something. And it's like, this is cool. But you're enjoying it's not that we're just chasing stuff frivolously. These are things that, and I love how Ivan, you pulled it out. This is something that brings your family joy. Mm -hmm. This is something that you get to experience every night. I'm sorry, every um, Thursday night, even, and Jessica's the one that says it. She's like, Hey, are we going to go watch survivor in the theater room? I'll be honest, guys, this dude gets excited when my wife says that <laughs> because it hasn't been that, that normally is not the case. For many, many years, Jessica never went into the theater room hardly. You know, if we wanted to watch a, a movie, she'd pick it out. Of course, it's a chick flick. I'm like, oh my gosh, what a waste of speakers, man. There's no nothing blowing up and <laughs> you know, dialogue and comedy, which is fun. But um, but now she's like, she wants to go in the theater room and watch mm -hmm. things that we enjoy together. And that's really the heartbeat of building a, a space for your family and your friends and and your children man my children 
have, you know, since they were younger, they would invite their friends over and they would do movie nights or they would have, um, there's a game that they play on the PS five called Jackbox. I don't mm -hmm. know if y'all played that. Yeah. That's a fun mm -hmm. one. Yeah. It's like a trivia game and everybody pulls out their phone and they log into the system and you can type in your answers and, and it's real interactive, hmm. you know? So it's one of those things where it brings people together. You know, it's yeah. more than just the gear. It really is about the relationships. Yeah. So similar story, you know, before I bought this house, I'd been living in an apartment for two years after my divorce mm -hmm. and my daughter maybe had friends over once or twice in that two year period. Yeah. Um, since we moved in here, you know, she had friends over a couple of times, but whenever they come over, they're down here. Yeah, they're not up in her room. They're not anywhere else in the house. They're down here in the theater. Mm -hmm. Who knows? You know, usually they're just watching, you know, Markiplier on YouTube. That weirdo. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the fact that they're down here enjoying it makes makes me happy. So now yeah. I can't get her to come down and watch a movie with just me because mm -hmm. I'm bad. But <laughs> so it, it's fun. Uh, but uh, back to the journey thing. Mm -hmm. If you're not on the journey. Are you a theater hobbyist or are you a movie watching hobbyist? Mm -hmm. I think there's a difference there. Sure. So, so what would that difference be to you? So for me, it, for me, I'm a home theater enthusiast. I, mm -hmm. I like the gear. I like the upgrades. I like figuring out how I can make it a little bit better than what it is currently versus, you know, somebody who just is a movie enthusiast. Mm -hmm. Sure. Or you built a theater to really just enjoy the movie. So right. for that person, it may not be the journey of how can I make my theater better? Mm -hmm. It's what movies are, are out. What, how big of a collection of movies can I get? Or, you know, yeah. that for me, that's the differentiator, I think, between a true theater enthusiast and a movie enthusiast. Mm -hmm. Is there some overlap? Of course, because, you know, you want good gear to watch your movies on. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know that there ever really is an end game. Yeah. I say there is for me, but I'll probably find something to upgrade at some point. <laughs> sure. And I've said that about my system, like the speakers and subwoofers are in game for me. Mm -hmm. I don't see me needing, wanting, desiring anything different. Now things like electronics, those are going to change. Eventually right. I'll change out my 4k player. Eventually, um, you know, I may get a different projector or, you know, something of that nature. There may be a different streaming device, a new Apple TV or whatever. Cause that stuff changes, but the speakers, you know, um, I'm, I'm where I'm at. I don't, I don't really, like I said, I don't see myself going any place different. Jonathan, I don't see you going anywhere different, dude. You like, you've no. reached euphoria in, and, and there's, you could spend a ton more money, but he's absolutely content. He's got a rock solid system and it brings a stinking smile to his face every time he sits down and, and, and listens to music or watches a movie. You know, so to me, I, I think having a journey is a great thing. Why? Why does it have to end? You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm with Ivan. It's like I'm not I'm not just chasing stuff. It's not about that. But to me, looking back at my entire home theater journey, which began in the days of Circuit City working there, bought my first Polk audio system at. Gosh, I think I got it at 75% or no, 60% off. I'm like, this is great. That was my first youth man deal. <laughs> and uh, and then I got a Velodyne subwoofer, 10 inch, 100 watts. Not much. I mean, it's like this thing wasn't great. But at that time, I was like, this is baller, man. It's amazing. And I just began to build it up over time, you know. So to me, looking back at that, I've enjoyed every aspect of the journey. You know, back when I got my first projector, the Panasonic AE, I think it was a 3000 U. Oh man, I was in love. I'm like, dude, I got a 103 inch screen. This is amazing. <laughs> you know, I loved it. And then when I upgraded to 150, guess what? And an Epson projector, I'm like, dude, this is amazing. You know, so every point of that journey, I've just absolutely enjoyed it and had so much fun with it. So Cool, man. I, and I'm going to bring this super chat up just because this was his comment. And so I love this, man. Hi, Finest. Appreciate the $20 super chat. He says, I appreciate you all. And I meant no offense. And we didn't take it offensively. And that's why I wanted to have this conversation. 
He said, part of my struggle is I don't have much of a home theater computer community. Brother, we're all in that. Well, except for you guys in Kansas City and and <laughs> uh, down in Texas. Y'all are a special breed. And um, there's a few communities, but we're working on it, I promise you. Um, he said, my only critics are on Instagram. Yeah, my system's around 60000 Dude, that's that's a lot of money. Yeah. A lot of money. Um, he says he's got the um, Bowers and Wickham 800 D fours. That's awesome. Um, but don't he, but he doesn't get single digits and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And so that man, I, I appreciate you. Dude. And I'm glad you didn't take our conversation as an attack on by any means on you. I just thought it was an interesting conversation to have because unfortunately there are toxic groups. No, no lie. Mm -hmm. There are those that, the only way that they feel validated is if they put somebody else's system down and, and think about, it. we see that in, in cars, we see it in sports. We see it in, in literally in every hobby. Um, what we're trying to create in the home theater space on this podcast, on my channel through M wave is really centered around a, a really healthy community, you know? Um, and so I, I love that, but man, I'm with you. I don't see enough, of the home theater community. We don't have connections and we don't know who's even in our area. So, but like I said, I actually had a conversation with a gentleman just this past week and I have another conversation with him this coming up week. And so I'm working on some things that hopefully could help out in that area. So Jonathan, you didn't say anything in the, in regards I'm going to let Rusty go. Cause I'm making a little slideshow. I want to show these oh, guys. No. <laughs> Thank you, All right. This is not a background. We're Next going level. school. We're, he's going to school us on this. I love it. What are, <laughs> yeah. what are your thoughts? Buddy? Well, I have a, a few thoughts. Um, one is, uh, I think you, I, I think there's a difference between gratitude mm -hmm. and and being um, content with what you have, and also uh, striving for more to do better. Mm -hmm. Not in. I don't think the two things are mutually exclusive. At, at least not know. to me. Mm -hmm. Um, I can love the speakers or whatever it is. I can love the thing I have. I can enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I can get that experience with my family and share it with other enthusiasts. I can, I can do all those things and still want to progress, you know, and if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. And I'm not going to be bitter about it, but it's nice to have. For me, I like to have something to shoot for, something that's a little out of reach that it drives me to work a little harder or to, you know, it, it's motivation. Um, so that's I, I don't think that wanting some an upgrade means that you aren't enjoying or grateful for what you have. Mm -hmm. um, I can I can see how some people may think that or may feel that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do y'all think about that? Do you, do you share that sentiment or I do any other comments? Yeah. Cause, I mean, and, and I guess where I come from and I've shared this on my channel, I've been content at every stage in, in my journey. Mm -hmm. When I had the Velodyne and the Polk audio, man, I'm watching movies. I'm grinning ear to ear. It wasn't, I was chasing something, but if an opportunity came up, if I got a raise or if I found a good deal on Craigslist and I would sell mm -hmm. what I had and buy what I, you know, what I wanted and upgrade. And I would just slowly upgrade over time, but it wasn't as if I was chasing anything. It was, it just, it just kind of happened. And then of course, with the YouTube thing, it opens up more opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been enjoying each part of that journey. And I don't know where my journey is going to be in 10 years or 20 years, but I'm going to enjoy what I've got right now and enjoy my time with my family and then down the road, if I have something bigger, better, you know, if we re, you know, buy a new home and and build a new theater, then maybe that's going to look different than what it does now. But until then, I'm just going to keep enjoying it, and keep smiling. So the other thing is, there's a I see a lot of talk about in game and what is in game. Um, sure. I don't <laughs> believe in in game because. Uh, technology is always changing. It's always mm -hmm. improving. There's new formats. There's new developments. Uh, there's, you know, we see bigger and bigger and better TVs all the time. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the fun of technology. Why I've loved it since I was a kid is that there's always something new to be developed or to discover. Um, 
And I don't know, it's that new, it's that yeah. like just how much has come, how far we've come. Like my first home theater was in my bedroom um, in my parents' house, probably 16, 17 years old. I had a 5.1 channel system um, and my TV was a 27 inch tube TV, right? Mm -hmm. It's, I'm glad that I didn't call that in game because that would have been sad, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, at that time I loved it. I've had the best setup of anybody I knew and mm -hmm. I, but I wouldn't call it in game. And I, and now look at, you know, we have these hundred and what, 120 inch TVs now that mm -hmm. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and that's part of the fun. And, you know, and I'm, I'd say somebody said something earlier in the comments um, about how much of it is tinkering versus enjoying the content. Mm -hmm. And I say, I think that's a good point to me. Half the fun of the hobby is researching, watching yeah. videos, Googling, you know, trying to figure out what to buy or what not to buy. And, mm -hmm. and like, it's, it's like, the it's the pursuit is part of the, the hobby for me that's that's right. that is the fun um but i also get to a point where i'm just tired of um i'm i'm tired of changing things and i just want to sit there and watch a bunch mm -hmm. of movies and enjoy it so i'd say i go through it's cyclical you know i'll be in a tinker mood for a while and then i'm tired of the mess and i just want to enjoy it for a while mm -hmm. but yeah. It's it's a cycle. Are y'all like that, or or am I alone? I was out of the tinkering mood until my center channel went out, <laughs> and now I'm back in the tinkering mood because I know right. you're going to get this new center channel, and it's I'm going to want to upgrade the left and right then, and then who knows yeah. what's going to come next. I can't seem to find my way out of the tinkering mode. I'm constantly <laughs> in the tinkering mode. My wife always tells me, like, why can't you just leave it alone? Enjoy it. But see, I, that's yeah, I, mean, really, I like it. That's the that's the thrill for you. Mm -hmm. Like, you, I don't think you're dissatisfied with what you have. Mm -hmm. That's part of the, the enjoyment that you get out of your system mm -hmm. is trying this and changing this and tweaking this. Mm -hmm. And if you guys knew how many dozens of hours I spent just comparing projectors, like watching the same movie side by side and stuff. <laughs> You would just be like, "What is wrong with him?" Yeah, <laughs> watch the movie, I've Jonathan, done that. You know? Yeah, like our I'm switching projectors in the middle of a movie. I've done that countless times too. Wow. My 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 family goes to go to the bathroom or something like because I got young kids and I'll switch the no. projector out in the middle of the movie and stuff. That's hilarious. <laughs> well, it's luckily for the chief mount, so I just pop it and stick the next oh, one up there. Right. That's phenomenal. That's Y'all don't phenomenal. mind me. I'm a snack snack on the. No, sandwich. you're totally good. I'm going to throw so, questions up here because it, it just ties in with this. He says, every time you mention that you want a sound bar on uh, home theater enthusiasts or the AVS forum, you know, the comments are coming. And maybe I don't need black swans with 50 inch sub in my bedroom. And, and that's unfortunate that there, like I said, there are groups out there that if you don't post a high end expensive system that, you know, people look down upon you and, um, I just choose not to do that. And that's just a choice. And that's the culture. And I guess that's the thing. I can't control their culture, but what I can kind of steer is the culture that we have here, the culture that we have at M wave. Um, and I really believe that the culture is created from the top down, you know, in any organization, any business, um, whatever the message that is conveyed, that'll kind of trickle down. And, and if that's not the culture that you want, this is not the group you need to be hanging out with go yeah. over there to a toxic group, go over there to a judgmental group. Cause that's not what we're about. Um, those of you that are, that have been to M wave and that are coming to M wave, you're going to be able to have conversations with people that are passionate about this hobby. And I promise you there's, there's not going to be a single person there. That's going to be like, Oh dang, you only got, you got that brand. Why you buy that? That's, that's messed up. It's not about that. I love hearing Scott newbie's heart, you know, you look at his and he's got, oh my gosh, like 2018s in his room by now. It's, it's insane. <laughs> but what I love about Scott is people come through his home and they attend his event and they'll say, they'll make comments like, and you know, I, I'm embarrassed to even share what I have. And Scott's like, why? And he's like, cause I don't have what you have. He's like, but you don't need to have what I have. Nobody mm -hmm. needs to have what he has. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, 
but but the the reality is Scott chooses again. He's I love his heart. I love Cat's heart. They're there for the hobby. They're true, truly there and passionate about celebrating everybody. Um, and again, I think that's just a choice that we all make. And and I'm glad that I'm surrounding myself with gentlemen like like these three right here that share that same attitude and share that same mm-hmm. passion for theater. Now, Michael, I had a question for you or, or maybe a thought. Um, yeah. So I know that oftentimes people say, well, we, we only talk about like the high end stuff or we only yeah. talk about, and, and first off, I don't think that that's mm-hmm. entirely true because I know that mm-hmm. I think you more than anyone uh, does uh, highlight the people that are, are a, and I don't even like saying budget. That almost sounds like demeaning. It's just you're at a different stage well, of the journey. Expensive. I mean, let's just face yeah. it. I mean, it's a price point. It's and that's what I return to is as budget and yeah, it's you're just is, at a different stage or a different, yeah. you know, a, a different level of commitment, and that's okay. So yeah. I see you uh highlight and praise that more than mm-hmm. anybody, mm-hmm. but I also understand from um an entertainment standpoint. Uh, in the community as a whole, yeah. what is entertaining to people and gets views and interest mm-hmm. is new, crazy, wild, <laughs> outlandish, over the top, you know, yeah, Ryan yeah. type home theaters. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Like that's going to be it's mm-hmm. and, and look for all of us. I don't I don't expect to ever have something like what Ryan is building. And I'm not mm-hmm. even like shooting for that. Yeah. But you know what? I sure can't wait to see it and experience it for myself because it's just mm-hmm. so wild. I find it fascinating. I, yeah. Yeah. What is it going to be like? That's a crazy new experience. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think, I, and I think that may be why sometimes it comes across that people say like, well, if it's not, you know, mm-hmm. mega dollars, it's not worthy of time. But yeah. I mean, with you, as a, a, a YouTube celebrity, what would you think about that? <laughs> like very, wow. Why do you have to throw that in there? Um, I mean, I agree as far. Well, yeah. All right. Let, let's just be real. The, the views or the videos they get pushed. Um, and I, I say pushed, uh, I, Gary says the YouTube algorithm Realize with YouTube, every time you say the word algorithm, just replace it with audience. So the mm-hmm. YouTube audience doesn't view, like they don't get as excited with budget videos or budget home theaters or small home theaters as they do a million dollar home theater. I mean, let's, and that's just the reality because the way YouTube works is I post a thumbnail and a title. And as you're scrolling on your phone, if a lot of people scroll past that, then that sends signals to YouTube saying that video is not that exciting because people aren't clicking on it. That's called mm-hmm. click through rate. So if the click through rate is low, you basically got to up your thumbnail or your title or a combination of both. If they click on the video and they start watching it, if they watch more than the first 30 seconds, that sends some signals to YouTube that, hey, this potentially could be a good video. If people start dropping off pretty early, those are negative signals and YouTube isn't going to push it out to more people. But if people see the, they're scrolling, they click then they start watching and they watch for long periods of time, then YouTube is more apt to go, Hey, this group of people liked it. Let me serve it up to more people and see if they like it. And they mm-hmm. just keep continuing to send it out until people just stop watching it. And that kind of has reached kind of the mass um, or maybe the maximum exposure that it's going to get. If that kind of makes sense. So I don't really think it's the algorithm. YouTube doesn't know if it's a an expensive home theater or a budget home theater. It just is basing its <laughs> like what I didn't even see what happened. Um, he brought me a water, but he couldn't resist his chance to get on the stream. Oh, so wait, I was looking this way when he when I saw him as he was leaving. Sorry, sorry for um, the interruption. Um you know what I'm saying? So it it really it's it's how my audience and even other people are responding to those videos and how long they're watching it. So if I make a video and it's more entertaining or maybe like you said, it's, it's something different that you normally don't see like a daggum star Wars home theater with a 20 foot screen. I mean, I'll never be able to afford that, but I sure heck think it's cool. Like that's pretty awesome. You know, 
Um, so, but you're right. So that they tend to get higher views, but it doesn't change what I do. Um, now, one thing that, and I shared this in another video, it sometimes it may seem like I don't do more home theater budget, you know, because a lot of people relate to those better. Um, but the reality is most brands aren't willing to pay to fly me over to Texas or to California to do one of their, let's say their entry level series. You know, if Focal were going to hire me to do that, and pay my way over there and sponsor the video, they're probably not going to sponsor their entry level. They would love to get one of theirs that features like their utopia series or one of those higher end ones, I would imagine, you know? So, um, so anyway, that's just kind of my thoughts on that. Jonathan, you got a whole dang slideshow or something you say you're well, so I was just trying to, that's going to oversell it a little bit. I was trying to figure out, some pictures of my home theater throughout the years. So I was on my oh, NAS ooh. digging up like kind of a sample photo from some different timelines. And I just uh, wanted to express first yeah. off that all the time, some of these, th this is going to start out pretty basic, but we had a blast with my yeah. friends and my family playing stuff through that home theater, no matter what it was from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Like my buddies would come over, we'd watch a movie together or something, you know, on a Friday night and everybody loved it. So it didn't, it wasn't like only when I had this room that we enjoyed the hobby. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, as I go through these pictures, some of them are going to look kind of, kind of lame by yeah. today's standards, but but they were a lot of fun, and I have a lot of good memories from it. So let me let me share my screen, and I'll show you what I'm talking about yep. here. And then I'm gonna make you big here. Go ahead. Well, where's my icon to share the screen? It's like not there. Let me my... remove some of this. It I don't think it's. Uh, <laughs> that. If that lets you do that. All right, I'm gonna have to resize it because it's like off the bottom. It looks like. Stand by. Here we go. Present. I see it. There you go. All right. Share screen. Entire screen. Share. All right. So go. this is uh, this is my very first apartment, like living on my own. Mm -hmm. I had this little home theater system. There's like a JBL 15 that I bought on UBID and I had some Wharfdale speakers and I had a little CRT. Look at my center channel speaker on can you even see that? It's probably so small. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. I was going to ask you if you could zoom it's in. It's a That's super awful. old blurry camera. It's yeah. like junky, junky photo. Oh, but I mean, this is how it was, too, right? I had to see uh, my center channel is on top of my TV and there's yeah. my receiver and everything. I had a lot of fun with that system. My buddies would come over, we'd listen to music, chill out, just hang out. You know, I was probably like 20 at the time or something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I that was enjoyable. And then, and then this was my... Mm -hmm. My first home I bought in 2004. So this was my home theater at that time. I had two wharf tail above the screen. I later tried it below and above. And these are the same towers. I had a couple infinity HPS 1000 subs. And this was a custom built subwoofer Ottoman that had four 15s in it. Uh, this room wasn't fancy. It wasn't, there was no acoustic treatment at all in there. And we still loved it. I mean, we played Xbox games late in the night, you know, with my buddies and, Everyone wanted to come over and watch a movie over at my house. It was a lot of yeah. fun. So not not like a killer system by any means, but yeah. just a lot of fun. And then this was the back of the room. So this, I mean, like mismatched couches, like it doesn't <laughs> matter. We had a blast, you know, enjoy what you have. Yes. Um, some Wharfdale towers in the back and chairs everywhere because we'd, we'd have like land parties. People bring over their Xboxes and I'd set up a second projector over the door here. So we had a projector in the front, projector in the back. We'd play split, split screen Halo and stuff. That was just a so lot. You, you have towers mounted to your wall. That's I, awesome. <laughs> I did and all mismatched speakers. I mean, I had like clip right on the there, wall here. And, well, it style. hasn't changed much. Look behind him. <laughs> I know. They're, those are meant to be mounted. They have brackets. <laughs> yeah, I, I bought some uh, I bought some <clears throat> some sort of bracket that I figured out how to make attached in there. It was probably not safe. It probably could have fallen mm -hmm. on somebody, especially these cords hanging down. You could trip on them or whatnot, but mm -hmm. whatever. It was a lot of fun. And look at, look at this wiring job. Isn't that something? These are cabinet door handles. I used to yeah, stick in there for the HDMI cords and so forth. No, that's creative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is my first, like what I'll call like a real nice system um, where I had JTR front soundstage. These are JTR two, two eights. And then I had a couple JTR captivators. And this is the same room. I had just remodeled it or remodeling might even be a strong word, but I had some water damage. So I had to redo the walls and I redid the floor at the time. So it wasn't just vinyl and old carpet and paint the ceiling on ugly brown. And 
but we had a lot of fun with that system. You know, I, that's when, at this point is when I started having people over with the AVS forum groups and mm. maybe even a couple of years before this with some of the Wharfdale type stuff, but, right. but, you know, like really getting involved with a lot of people and sharing the room and enjoying it. Actually, this one should have been before that. This is a Wharfdale center channel okay. and Wharfdale towers. I just bought the JTR subs. So, um, you know, had, had Wharfdale system of some sort and, and there's so many iterations. I mean, gosh, I've probably gone yeah. through like 30 different center channels. So this is not everything. These are just sure. some snapshots in time. Like, yeah. Yep. And so then when we went to our current house in blue Springs, um, I, I had the JTR two, two eights, I built them into the wall and thought, you know, this is in game for me. And that's always a lie that never really happens. So these are the, the subwoofers on the ground. I ended up going with, um, some Mackie C two hundreds, which we've talked about on the channel here before I ended up replacing everything with just these. So I could have all matching speakers because mm -hmm. I started realizing, well, let me give you the long and short of this. I had JTRs behind the front soundstage that I told you that I had. And then I found these Mackies for like so cheap. It was ridiculous uh, from Adorama. And I bought the rest and I made all my surrounds, these Mackies. And in the course of playing around, I realized that I liked all matching Mackies more than I liked having front JTR and rear, like all my surround and ceiling is Mackies. So I ended up buying three more J Mackies and selling the JTR off. And then I had all matching speakers. And that was kind of like that. There's You're something like, special something here. Yeah. There's something special about all matching speakers where the soundstage is just all universal and everything like an object moves around the room. At that time, it wasn't even Dolby Atmos really. Mm -hmm. it, sure. But, but, as objects move around the room or as the sound moves around the room, it sounds very similar. And that's a lot of, I mean, there's neat, there's a neat function there. So then, uh, you know, my last set was these uh, JBL CBTs mm. before I got them hung. So it, it, just throughout all this stuff, I, I just reiterate, like, yes, the gear is upgraded, but the fun level has just been there from the very beginning. So yes. I want to encourage you, even if your room, you know, looks like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> invite some people over and enjoy it and get in the hobby space, you know, like go on AVS Foreman's, find your local group and say, Hey, I'd like to come over and see your theater. I want to come over and watch a movie at my place. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. People have a lot of fun and we have some guys in our group in Kansas city right now that have, you know, I mean, equivalent to this level group and they still invite people over and we still go and we still have a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, I mean, it's, it's there to be had. You don't have to have some sort of elite gear to enjoy yourself in this hobby space. That's for sure. Yeah your uh your the the one that you had with like the business pull down screen that mm -hmm. that one reminded me i had a like a business projector i don't even know what it was and i just had a sheet tacked onto the wall in an apartment and i thought i had the coolest setup in the world and everybody mm -hmm. loved to come over and look at it you know mm -hmm. it was nothing it was nothing special but mm -hmm. it was fun mm -hmm. <clears throat> We used to always take my projector out in the yard too at some of my college houses that we rented and put the projector up on the side of the house and play like yeah. Mario Kart and stuff. Bring the couches out. <laughs> How that's so fun, those memories. Didn't we didn't have you do that like a year ago I, with, with an inflatable one. Yeah, I mean, we still do that now, but but you know, just even back in the old days, I just have a lot of fond memories from this hobby, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Over the course of time. And that's the thing, you got to start somewhere. And again, you don't necessarily have to even have a desire to get where anybody else is, but where you want to go. And some of you, you don't need to go down this crazy deep rabbit hole. You might do a 5.1 and never have a desire to do Atmos. And that's awesome. Nothing wrong with that. Some of you may have a sound bar and a little subwoofer. If that meets your needs, puts a smile on your face, brings your family together, and you're able to build memories together, that's really, really all that matters, you know, when it comes to it at the end of the day. Look at yeah, Bruce laying down some uh, truth here. Nobody's coming over here with 28 tube TV today. <laughs> I might just because that's a relic. <laughs> I, love I do it just so I can make fun of you. I think it's <laughs> awesome, man. Well, that's been, that's been super cool, man. So definitely I share the same with JW Love, man. Awesome presentation. But it just goes to show you, I did something similar. It took me forever to do because I had to go back and, and just kind of go back through thousands, literally, of photos. Oh, yeah. Of my past, you know, 20 years or so building my home theater. But I, I made a video on my channel. If you haven't seen it, um, I encourage you to go watch it. It's called um, just search for Youth Man Journey. 
and you'll see a picture. This isn't my first home theater, but this is the like what my theater room looked like um, when we first bought this house 17, about 18 years ago. So I had some clip speakers. The front two are RF 83s. They were brand new speakers. The first brand new speakers I ever owned. And I got them, of course, youth man deal. I offered to build a website for a local home theater installer. Their website looked terrible. They had popcorn, like a cheesy popcorn um, um, clip art on the homepage. And they were selling like Bowers and Wilkins and mm. uh, Adcom mm -hmm. amplifiers and some high-end stuff, Crestron. I'm like, I'm looking at their website going, this is not a good reflection of a high-end place. And I'm like, I could redesign this and make it look really nice. Um, would you buy me some speakers? And they went, deal. So they bought me a pair of, I think those were maybe $1,200 a piece. So like $2,400. bucks. i am going, dude, this is awesome. Um, I had that center channel. I think I paid $150 bucks for it. That actually doesn't match, of course, but it still clips. The Velodyne subwoofer I bought, I paid $250 for that subwoofer. It's a 15 inch with a two with a 250 watt amplifier on it. I paid 250 for that, but I also got three clip speakers with it. And so I ended up, I was going to keep the sub, sell the clips and fell in love with the clips and ended up, that was what started my home theater journey and, and clips the, um, oh my goodness, the Sony DVD player down there. That was probably like 15 bucks at a yard sale. Looks like a Wii. Custom Entertainment Center, guys. I, that thing is dope. That was that cost me the most. That little blue tote, <laughs> Walmart um, speaker stand. You know, yeah, I think I was a 19-inch TV. I didn't have a projector <laughs> yet, but I used what I had. You know, I'd play. Uh, I'd hook that system up. I had a the Yamaha. I think I paid 400 bucks for it. Some HDMI cables, a bunch of Blu-rays. So on the screen, did you actually use that as a display or is this just out, like yeah. setting no, it up? No, starting out. Now, this may not wow. have been in there for, here's the thing. So I started, I painted the room, so that's red. Mm -hmm. um, and so while we're trying to figure out, I, I was building a riser in the back. So while we're doing that, I had to have something and I didn't own a projector because it was going to cost me three grand. So I had to save up for that. So while I'm saving up, this is literally what I used in the theater room and we didn't have a tv in the living room my kids had some tvs i think eventually well no even starting out they didn't get tvs till way later um but that's what i use i now, honestly i can't remember how long i used that but eventually we built a cabinet um and that cabinet has um you know it had a 103 inch screen and used that for a long time we built the riser uh added theater seating and then eventually upgraded the speakers and now the speakers were too big to fit behind the screen and it wasn't acoustic transparent anyway. So then we went to a 150 inch screen, rebuilt the whole front cabinet. And so the journey has just progressed um, along the way. I've got to quit reading these comments. I keep laughing at the most inopportune time. This, this one, there, what this is, is common of the night. Asthma from the office. Yeah. <laughs> That that episode was hilarious when they <laughs> did the tour. Let me show oh, you around. Me. Here's my home theater. <laughs> that's funny. I'm reading. I was that. laughing at Bruce's comment about Jonathan telling him it wouldn't hit reference. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah, I man. still have my clip speakers. They're in the living room. They still sound yeah. good. And they were the cheap Best Buy clips. They weren't even the good ones. Yeah, you had the entry level ones. Yeah. Probably the reference or maybe Synergy. Uh, I think they're the the low end reference speakers. Okay. I'd have to go yeah. up and look at the model number on them. I've had them for like I said, those things are twenty years old now. So if they're twenty years old, that was before. Uh, are they ceramic metallic woofers or no, gray? They're gray. Okay, so that would probably be the Synergy series. Yeah. So yeah. And I still they still rock. So yeah. and and a little, I couldn't even tell you what sub I have up in the living room. Yeah. So couldn't have no idea what sub that is. Yeah, I saw somebody mention earlier. I don't know where it was, but um, oh, here it is. So Jason said, Michael Youthman got me into clips. So that mm -hmm. was, I probably have more clips videos than any other content creator on this platform. Um, I have 90, I think there's 92 
clips videos, but that's, I mean, everything I owned for many, many, many years was clips and I still enjoy clips. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't, and it's sad. You know, some people will go, well, you know, they'll down talk people that do have clips and they'll say, well, eventually you'll, you know, upgrade to something better. Some people don't. And that's okay. You know, if it meets your needs, puts a smile on your face, who cares what brand it is? You know what I mean? That was uh, clips was my first set of towers. I started off with like satellite speakers, you know, like those mm -hmm. little, I think they were JBL. I yeah. can't even remember now. And then my first set of tower speakers were clips. Right. Bruce said he moved his whole system into his bedroom. I love it. Hey, nothing wrong with that. Awesome, man. Maybe I ought to do that while I'm, before I have. Well, and I have on. that problem too of like, I don't like to get rid of things. I just move it to a different room mm -hmm. to where eventually mm -hmm. I've got, a, you know, a decent setup everywhere, but mm -hmm. I do need to get rid of some stuff. And Rob, I appreciate oh. the kind words. He says, this is a fantastic discussion. 25 years ago, I built my first in-game theater. It was the on the lower level with a sliding glass door and a fireplace. All the while, I thought I had it all. Mm -hmm. oh, and this, man. I'm glad you pulled up that comment because that touched on something that I wanted to kind of come back to. When I yeah. say there is no in-game, what I mean by that is kind of what he described better mm -hmm. is that you, it's like, I am my end game is where I'm at today until mm -hmm. you it is only natural that if you would experience when you experience new things, you've broadened mm -hmm. your horizons, you've learned about things that you didn't know existed mm -hmm. before. Right. And so to me, end game is this constantly evolving target because you have new life experiences. Mm -hmm. There's new technology. Mm -hmm. There's new stuff. And also you change. Like over time, sure. and sometimes I've changed and I've, I've gone the other way. I've started to go mm -hmm. down because yeah. um, it's too complicated. You, you know, you don't want to do all the fuss. And so now you're back to like, I'm with you, Ivan. On I like my Apple TV remote, especially in the living room. And I like CEC. It works really well in that room. Mm -hmm. I, I like yeah. CEC. I know that it's not always the most reliable for every mm -hmm. setup. But sometimes I like going backwards into simpler. It's just mm -hmm. simpler makes it more enjoyable. So, yeah. you know, when I say there's no end game, it's because I'm always changing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I love this comment. John says, you reach your dreams and then you have new dreams. Yeah. I heard That's I heard the one. rock. He was he was given a like an interview. Um, and they were asking him why, mm -hmm. like where he was headed next. And um, it seemed like he wasn't like wrapping up his career. He was kind of like just getting started. And, mm -hmm. and his response was, you know, I've reached a mountain and now I want to, I want to experience another mountain. That's all it is. It's not a bigger mountain. It's just, a, I just want to experience another mountain. Um, so I love that thought. You reach your dreams and then you have new dreams. That's cool, man. Appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. yeah. That's maturing. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, when I had my Sony home theater in a box, it was great. Yeah. And then they came out with the, that's when they came out with the center, rear center channel. Mm -hmm. I was like, ooh, I need that. And then then they came out with Atmos. And so yeah. it's just been a steady progression because technology sure. changes. And one thing that, that I'm excited about, M-Wave, is that you're going to get a chance to hear a bunch of different things just at the show. So we've got some um, more affordable products like SVS and Clips are going to be there. Um, we've got some, you know, higher end stuff. We got a Sendo, we've got RBH, and so really, but it just gives you that perspective. You know, you may not ever go to a fifty inch subwoofer, and you may not need one, but the reality is, um, there's just so much out there. And I just enjoy it all, man. I just want to hear it. I want to experience it. I love getting the opportunities to do home theater tours. Um, and I know not everybody's able to do that. And so I try to share my experience. I saw Ike, he made a cool comment earlier. Um, he says, traveling to capture budget friendly home theaters is a tough proposition for like a brand, you know? And even me, it's like the money that I'll make on a YouTube video is so insignificant, guys. I mean, seriously, we're most of the time it's a couple hundred bucks. So for me to buy a flight, go across the, you know, the U S 
stay, you know, in a hotel. It's like, it, it just doesn't even pay for itself, much less, you know, feed my family. So Ike's right. And so they've actually taken a different approach on their channel. So on the home theater hub, um, they've started a podcast and they have people on and they kind of do live tours. So it'd be like Ivan with his cell phone and he can walk around the room. And, and so they do a, not a virtual tour, but it's just a, a live tour, I guess. So um, absolutely, man. So I appreciate what they're doing. And I even saw, an, um, you know, we were talking about community earlier and Neil uh, appreciate him and appreciate the $5 super chat. They started an amazing group in the tri-state area. So if you're up there and, and you're looking for people to connect with and do these home theater tours and, and get togethers or home theater crawls, They've got a great group. And so just search for them on, on uh, Facebook, but that's really what it is, man. We're sharing our passion for home theater with each other. And, um, and I love it and I, I can't, I can't see myself doing anything else, you know, but kind of going back to what Ivan said is like, I didn't even plan this. I didn't plan to be on YouTube. I was a student <laughs> master for 23 years and that's where youth man came from. I've got a video on that. Um, if you search for youth man, like who is youth man or something like that. And where does that name come from? But I didn't plan this. I just really felt that God was leading me in a different direction. We began to pray about it and I resigned at my church. I'd been there 13 years at one church and ended up being a communication specialist for a nonprofit Christian organization. Did that for a year. And um, I was doing devotionals every day on how to be a kingdom driven entrepreneur. You know, how do you, how do you do business God's way? How do you serve people and love people? And, and that's just really my heartbeat. And God was like, all right, in the middle of a pandemic, the beginning of a pandemic, you're just going to go full-time YouTube. And I'm like, let's do it, you know, and just trying to be obedient to that. So, well, cool, man. We've had some great discussion. I want to jump into, unless you guys have anything else, I'll jump into some questions before we wrap up the night. I think there was one more comment in here. I'm going to try to find real quick yeah. that I thought was pertinent to this, but it, perfect. Uh, Bruce mentioned it. So it starts, we would have hit it anyway, but it's just saying like, realistically, if you guys think you can't start out like us, like, look at what, mm -hmm. look at what we started with. I mean, you saw yeah. Michael's and my equipment on yeah. pictures. We didn't start out with anything fancy. It's not mm -hmm. like we just landed here. Yep. That's the journey. And, and I love how he says that, you know, a lot of you are starting well beyond what we started. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you're starting off with a, a, a much higher end. I mean, even Ivan, you, you had a, a basic clip system. Some people start off with the sound bar or a home theater in a box. And so it's not about where we start mm -hmm. or even where we end up. It's literally, let's enjoy the hobby. Let's enjoy the journey together. Yeah. I had the $300 Panasonic home theater in a box with the color coded plugs. So you couldn't <laughs> mess it up. <laughs> Yeah, my first system was an AIWA a home theater in a box. Oh, the but, Iowa. Why do you yeah. spell it like that? Uh, I don't know how to say it, so I just Iowa. spelled it. Yeah, Iowa. That was the system, man. When I worked mm -hmm. at Circuit City for the little portable deal, none of the other ones. It was only like $300. Why was it the system? You're saying it was better than other stuff at Circuit City? It, it was. Yeah, the Sony, the Techniques, um, and there was uh, JVC had one. Dude, and really what it came down to, it just had better bass. <laughs> I mean, like it, it would thump, and everybody's like, "That's rad, mm -hmm. man!" I didn't even get to compare it to anything. I bought it. Do you guys ever do a U bid back in the day? U B I D E. You, <laughs> yeah, I remember I that. Yeah. Yes, I do. They they would run just stupid. I mean, yep. like sometimes auctions would go for next to nothing, and so I got a lot of my gear back in the early day from U bid, and that yeah. I mean I bought it unheard. That was my first system. I was in high school still, and I it sounded great. I didn't know any better, but it sounded great. Mm -hmm. Sweet. All right. Well, let's go and jump into, uh, appreciate the super chat, Nicholas. I know it took a while, but I wanted to kind of, I try to keep things in groups. And so we have a discussion then we have our, our questions. And so Nicholas appreciate the $8 super chat. Is there benefits of having towers that dig to 30 Hertz over towers that dig to 60 Hertz when basically you're using a crossover in your subwoofer and the subwoofers are handling maybe 80 Hertz and below. Man, that's a cool question. He's looking at maybe JTR 212 RTs, which are towers, versus maybe the 212 HTR, which I have. So they really don't run that low. I mean, they're, they, they, yeah, they don't dig that deep, I guess. So, man, that's a great question. 
So if you're using subwoofers, does it really matter how dig how deep the your towers dig because the subwoofers are handling those frequencies anyway? Yeah, that's what I would say. Unless you're going to be Jonathan, you're tilting your head like you don't agree. Well, <laughs> you, I, I, you could ask five people this, and they'd all have five different responses. Yeah. Probably. So I don't fault you guys for having a different opinion if we end up that way. But go ahead. Ivan. Yeah, I, I, for me, the only reason I would say that it would matter is if you were doing some two channel, some pure two channel enthusiasts listening, where you're not using subs, then maybe wrong. You know, that would be the only time that I think it would matter. But for me, like so, my mm -hmm. crossover set at like seventy hertz. Mm -hmm. um might even be higher than that so if, for me i don't think it would matter in my setup mm -hmm. so and i'm along the lines of you because it depends on where the crossover is so like 60 hertz if you've got your crossover maybe at 80 hertz or 90 hertz um that's it could because a, a crossover isn't a brick wall you know it doesn't just stop right there it kind of rolls off over not time but over frequencies am i saying that right what am I saying, Jonathan? How do you just explain that curve? So it's like not, it rolls uh, off as the frequency decreases, or you like on. Mm -hmm. So it, yeah, and it, it it should roll off at like a real shallow filter, usually like twelve dB per octave on a receiver is common. So okay. it's not it's not time delay. It's just it's just but that's attenuating I mean, like, the signal. Yes, yeah. twelve dB per octave. So it's not like a hard eighty hertz and below. This gets right. it, and eighty hertz and above. This gets it. You're right. Um. So I could see where if you're running a higher crossover that that might be or no, it'd be the other way. If you're running a lower crossover, then that might make a bigger difference. Um, but I, I, I would I say, say that, this, though, when I upgraded to the 208s, I actually did lower my crossover point. Mm -hmm. So and there's definitely more mid bass in the room with the 208s than there was with the F36s. So mm -hmm. you know there maybe there is something to it. And I'm gonna remove this just for now so we don't Sorry. hide your face. That's okay. Well, <laughs> I wasn't. I was getting it I'm ready gone. and I didn't wasn't ready to. I'm show not it. doing it. What is it doing, man? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There I am. All right, go ahead, Jonathan. I wouldn't. I didn't bring that, this up. I don't know. Who that was it. me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. I was trying to get it on stage, but I didn't mean to put it up on the screen yet. I still don't know oh, how to okay. use StreamYard. I'm an amateur. Okay, just hit the um. You can hit the remove button down there, and it it leaves it on the back end, but it doesn't show it. Okay. So whenever but the hard ready, part is, as soon as you say share, it shares it immediately. There's not yeah. a way to bring it in the back end at first. So, all right. So Rusty, what are your thoughts before we get to Jonathan? Because I want to hear his. Assessment. Yeah, I want to. I want to talk first. I, I think and it's going to be completely him Correct me on exactly. On and I'm okay. With that. I don't know that this has a hard objective right. I yeah, don't really. Yeah. I'm not sure Take that me it to does. school. Okay. All right. So here's here's what a, a good illustration that I follow, and I, I what I think is a good rule of thumb mm -hmm. is you want your you want there to be an overlap in mm -hmm. between your your um your highs and your subwoofers, mm -hmm. right? Your speakers and your subwoofers. And so how much overlap do you want? Well, in this case, if the crossover point right here is at mm -hmm. 100 Hertz, then you okay. would want your um, subwoofer to play to an octave above, which would be 200 Hertz. And you want your satellite speakers to play an octave below, which would be 50 Hertz. Um, that way you've got good overlap and a good transition from one speaker to another okay or from your subwoofer to your satellite speaker so there's some data driven not just opinion like mine and, and ivan so we're like we're kind of guessing over here all right i think Jonathan, that's a, i think that's a bad graph ah uh, i'm not critical oh, of you but the graph is terrible <laughs> i say that because <laughs> because look at the green line that's supposed to be representative of the two filters but if you had those crossover points, you would have a dip at 100 hertz of 5 dB. Like it doesn't just magically pop up 5 dB. It's the sum of the two lines. So I think it's trying to it's trying to illustrate what it's doing, but it's kind of a bad example. They should have they should have mm -hmm. have the the red cross and the and you know further in. So when they crossed, there was not much of a dip yeah. there. But when they cross at 80 um, dB, don't you get the constructive interference, and that's where you're getting the 85 dB. I when I overlay my lines with OmniMic and I'm watching it real time, mm -hmm. that's not how that looks. Like 
Okay. I don't know. I mean, I don't, this, this, the technicalities of it, I probably can't get into because I don't know them, but I just know from practice and watching it, like mm-hmm. that's, that's not how that looks. That's not what it would work. Yeah. So, uh, we, we should do a little bit of experimenting with that on one of our shows. Maybe I think we could make that happen as a live illustration. All right, cool. Um, oh, I take it back. Delete that part, Michael. <laughs> I you can do that live, right? That. <laughs> yeah, I like SRW1000 says uh, direct art would benefit from speakers that can play lower. So my thought on this is that I, I don't know that I... Well, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Got a horn all of a sudden. Um, awesome. I I've heard I don't have hardly any experience, and I don't think most people do of having a true full range in a seven bed layer or nine bed layer setup. I mean, realistically, there I, I probably experienced it one time at a show. They had JTR two fifteen HTs in every position and no subs. Wow! And it was phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, it was it was speakers, truly phenomenal. Yeah. That was uh, Expona maybe two thousand nineteen or two thousand seventeen. Mm-hmm. Those two years I went, I don't remember which year it was. Yeah. It always made me curious, like how that would be if you had, because you to for it to be truly full range and not have to deal with port issues, you want that tuning frequency to be low enough where it's not interfering with like audible subs. Mm-hmm. And fifteen is probably in that realm, right? Because most people don't hear that low. If you have thirty hertz tuned speakers, and now you're trying to integrate subs, you got all kinds of bad stuff happening because your subs, if you got sealed subs, for instance, and your port tune on your speakers is thirty, you're you're or even if your port tune on your subs is 20 or 25, when you're introducing different port tunes, there's mm-hmm. a roll off that, that changes the phasing at the port tune with, you have a high pass filter. So if you have subs and speakers with different high pass filters at different points, you get all kinds of interference. And it's not just in that area between the two port tunes. It's not only like 15 to 25 Hertz or whatever. It's right. also cycling up above into the higher frequencies where it makes disturbances. So yeah. it's kind of can be tricky to implement a full range speaker if it's in the 35, 40 hertz, 30 hertz type range with a subwoofer system. Mm-hmm. If you had full range speakers that were 10, 15 hertz tuned or just even sealed, right? that could be a really interesting thing to test. Mm. Um, I don't think it's in practical per- practical terms, I don't think it's really that necessary. Like if you have a good subwoofer system with a lot of different subwoofers around the room right, and you have a good response through your seating range, since we don't hear direction bass and you know, I've tested with that very directly. And then the science is out there from THX and everything. People don't hear the direction bass comes when it gets above about 80 or 90 Hertz. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's that critical. And I have tested in my room with the base extension modules on these CBTs that drop the frequency down to like 45 from its normal 65. And I run them at eight at, at 90. So I played with that, you know, running a 45 Hertz range speaker versus nine 90 Hertz crossover. Right. I couldn't tell the difference in my room, which is why I don't have the base modules because I was like, why would I spend an extra five or $600 a speaker used right. for something I can't tell the difference. Now, someone had mentioned with stereo, it might make sense. And I think there is validity there. Like if you do two channel direct sound with no subwoofers on and you're just doing that, then the full range, you can definitely tell it's working. But if your subwoofer system is properly integrated and a nice quality subwoofer system, I, I, I don't think there's any advantage to it. That'd be my that'd be my experience so far. I really thought Jonathan was gonna be like, "You guys are all stupid, man." Of course it matters. <laughs> I I would like to know. I mean, that'd be a great thing for that. M-Wave. if yeah. we could if if you could get some like maybe even Jeff at some year could bring the two fifteen HTs, show that yeah. off again, and then run it with subs and without subs and A B and let us let us hear. Mm, now the trick would be you'd want to level match very carefully so that mm-hmm. the subwoofer system didn't have them running fifteen dB hot and sure. You know, it's like nine day difference. But if you level match very carefully, it'd be, I'd be interested. I'd be interested to learn more. And just as a, a follow up on that, Nicholas, appreciate it. again the eight dollars super chat. He says he got, look. I don't know if he's looking at or if this is what he has. He says dual RS twos up front. If wanting four subs, is dual RS one in the rear suffice, or is another dual RS two required to keep up with RS two up front? My understanding, the RS2s, I think Tony said, I mean, they would play 6 dB louder, right? An RS2 is basically the yeah, same, because... amp- same amplifier, but it just doubles the driver. I don't think we they double the power. If they don't double the power, then it's only 3 dB. 3, okay. But if they double the driver and the power, it's 6 dB for co-located stacked. 
effectively? That, uh, honestly, I don't know. So the 4,000 watt continuous. Aren't the S2, aren't oh, the S1s 2,400 watts? I, I think they... the thing is there, it's shared. If you don't mind, look up on the website. So yep. the, the 4,000 watt amplifier. So you're basically getting 2,000 to each 18. So Jonathan's going to look Yeah, up. so the RS1 is 2,400 watts. So you okay. are you are effectively doubling mm -hmm. power or close enough to 4,000 versus 2,400. So yeah, you're looking closer to six is, is that synopsis. Okay. But it's not, so, I don't think that's going to be a deal breaker because you can, I mean, if you're trying to run them for all it's worth, then yes, you know, you'd want to have equal capability, but you have other things that come into play like boundary gain and, uh, you know, room interactions and nodes and moles, nodes and moles, <laughs> <laughs> it's a moles nodes right. and knolls, if I could yeah. talk that will, that will make up for three or four dB easy, if not more, yeah. you know, uh, well, maybe the, way the more. Thing, in boundary dude, I know in my room, my RS2s are at like literally, I think they're at a quarter volume. Mm -hmm. or quarter gain i guess not volume quarter gain so there's definitely way more headroom um so it would be easy in most setup unless you got a massive massive room to basically pull down the rs2s so that they balance the rs1s as far as same level matching and you'd probably still have more headroom than, than what you need yeah i think so. that's fine nicholas mm -hmm. all right did you pull something up um no, just uh, just by specs. You asked what the amp was on the RS one. It was twenty four hundred. Oh no, uh, Rusty. I think you had something. You were cycling through something in the back. Okay. No, I'm no. It was just that one page. Okay. Home theater nerd. Appreciate the follow of super chat. Can you guys talk about what method you each use for determining your sub to speaker crossover? So we talked about crossovers earlier. What's the best way to kind of figure that out? You know, I use Jonathan. <laughs> Jonathan, come tweak my system. <laughs> and I'll be honest, I'm not an expert at this at all. You know, um, you know, the THX says 80 Hertz is a good starting point. Um, Jeff from JTR, he said, I would recommend running yours at about 60 Hertz. So I run them at 60 Hertz just on his recommendation. Now, could we measure that and figure out a, the best crossover? Probably, but I didn't do that in my own home theater. So how do you determine like what crossover works best? It's a good is question. A good answer or is it a? It's a good question. It's not. I don't think it's that difficult. If you have a measuring mic like Omni Mic or REW, and you measure, you'll absolutely see a smoother integration at different crossover points. And your timing between like your your distance levels is the effect, effectively the timing on your receiver. Mm -hmm. By adjusting that timing, if it's not exactly a smooth crossover point, you can make it smooth. A lot of times I think Odyssey sets the crossover low point not exactly right. And simply by oh, changing it, when I'm measuring my graph, like Odyssey will set these to 70 hertz. 70 hertz has a nice dip at the crossover point, kind of like that graph that we were just looking at that Rusty pulled up. But mm -hmm. if I just simply by changing it to 90, my response yeah, goes just perfectly out. flat down there. And it and it doesn't really make sense to me how that uh, would be detected wrong by the receiver, so to speak. But it's pretty reliable yeah. that it does that. So yeah. at least with Odyssey. Um, now, as far as picking up, I picked 90 hertz before I even really knew how to do measuring gear just from personal preference. There's a distinct difference in sound as you raise or lower the crossover point. Um, like, say you set 40 hertz. Mm -hmm. Your subwoofers don't even really come into play very much with regular music at that point. So it's kind mm -hmm. of more of a natural, neutral level, and some people like that. If you, mm -hmm. if, if you, if you increase your subwoofer volume, like if you play them 560 dB hot, 10 dB hot, whatever, as you increase that subwoofer point, your crossover point actually moves. We've talked about that before. So if your subwoofers are relative to your speakers, 510 dB hot, the crossover point is not a brick wall. It rolls off. As you increase that crossover point, it rolls off more if your subs are elevated. So you might be choosing like a 90 hertz, but it is more like 150 hertz or 120 hertz because your subs are elevated. If they're neutral, that's not really the case. You're kind of just moving your crossover point and the interaction mm -hmm. between the two. Um, <clears throat> try for fun, just try for fun, crank that crossover point on your subs up to 250 hertz. And what you'll experience is a, like a very live, like rock sound. If you con consider like a public audio DJ thing or something like a wedding or something, or, you know, a wedding reception dance party or something where it's in that chest cavity and it's really, really activated. Lowering that crossover usually kind of cleans up the sound and raising that crossover kind of makes it more full or more 
I don't know, just gives it more of that live sound. So it's something to play with. And I just think if you don't have the measuring equipment to, to listen to it or to measure it, then listen to it and see what you like. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with settling 120 or 150 if you prefer it or lower if you prefer that. Jonathan, do you think the crossover has more to do with the room or does it have more to do with the speakers or maybe even a combination of both? I think you can work your way out of a problem with placement by changing your crossover point too. So if you have okay. some boundary interaction with your room based on your subwoofer placement and just, you know, we've modeled this a lot of times in just our own theaters as we run mic sweeps, mm -hmm. you might have a dip just because of a room interaction at say 70 Hertz. Right. In that case, if your speakers can handle it, say your speakers can handle 50 Hertz or something, you might lower or or try to cover that say 70 Hertz dip because your subs, because of your subs placement, if you can't move it, then mm -hmm. you can kind of cover over it with the speaker and vice mm -hmm. versa. If you have a speaker, say you have a speaker interaction because of a distance thing of, at 110, 120 Hertz, mm -hmm. maybe your sub doesn't have that. You can raise your crossover point and kind of mask the speaker's deficiency at that level too. So you're not going to probably figure this stuff out without a microphone, sure. but, but when you have a, you know, a microphone and you're running sweeps, you can really, you can really kind of, complement each other and, and rid a problem that one of the devices would have on its own. Yeah. Speaking of microphone, OmniMic is supposed to be coming out with their version two or three? Three. three. Version three, three in the I've next two, month or so? Yeah. We don't know. It's almost a I, gag at I, this I point. Saw, I saw a gentleman earlier. He said he's working on, I think he's actually building an OmniMic. Did y'all see that comment? No. It was, it was quite a bit earlier. Like really well, early. He said he's bringing an omnidirectional speaker. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I thought it, when I saw Omni, I was like, oh, that's an Omni mic. So he's basically a prototype Omni speaker. Okay. Like an Omni directional speaker. I got you. So I misunderstood that. So the deal, I set my crossover just using direct live bass control and, mm -hmm. um, and, and I maybe adjust a little bit based off of that guide that Jonathan's invalidated. Mm -hmm. So I, maybe I need to go revisit this later to, uh, later this week. But question for you, Michael, or maybe Jonathan or Ivan. Um, there was you, Michael, you have the 212 HTRs, right? Right, right. Okay, so according to the specs, it says they play down to 60 hertz, plus mm -hmm. or so minus 3 dB. Low. Correct. So I'm curious why Jeff would say to set your crossover at 60 hertz when that's like yeah. at the bottom that's limit the bottom of those limit, speakers. Yeah. I, I, I'm not questioning mm -hmm. him, but sure. it just not what I would normally expect. Mm -hmm. Did he look at a graph of your room? I know you have some room interactions and so I forth. I think, yeah, originally it was mm -hmm. just over the phone, like, because I asked him, I'm like, you know, is there a recommended? And so that's what, at least now I've slept since then. I'm pretty sure that's what he told me. This was what three years ago. So um <laughs> I'm not calling you out. I was just trying to learn. No, I, yeah. No, I think that's where I've got them at 60 hertz. So but I okay. I, I've it'd be probably beneficial for me to take some measurements and see where the best crossover would be. The hard part for me, man, is I I'm literally like doing everything else but my own. Like Jonathan gets to play in his room and tinker all day long. I tinker with everybody else's stuff, mm -hmm. you know, I'm tinkering with that. Somebody asked, Hey, Michael, how's that AVM 70 coming? It's coming. You know, <laughs> I, at least, I, at least did the, I at least did the first video on it. I did the unboxing. I did a, uh, you know, a setup and everything. We did a walkthrough of that. Um, so it's, it's a little buggy. So it's got, I've just run into some mostly HDMI issues, like handshake issues. So sometimes I'll turn it on and there's no audio or video. So I have to like shut it down, turn it back on. And it says, oh, okay, I know where that's at. So I get some stuff like that every once in a while. But So where Rusty's going with that is probably that most people would recommend you go like a half an octave mm -hmm. or a full octave above your crossover point just as kind of a safety thing. Yeah. But, it, but the reality is for the counterpoint on his speakers, they have so much headroom. They're like 135 dB capable mm -hmm. that he's still above port turn now. The, if the crossover is at 60 hertz, it's going to be right on the edge, right? But it's but he's probably not ever going to be hitting the headroom where he's going to be distorting the speakers or something. Whereas if he had like a consumer brand, you know, just speaker, then you might not want to do that. Um, 
your crossover point on your speakers is where they're starting to roll off because of port tune, right? So you're if you're if your crossover on your speaker is going down at 65 hertz or 60 hertz or whatever it is, and you're also doing it with the receiver, you kind of double crossover into that and it makes it fall off faster potentially. Mm-hmm. If you go higher, then it then it's just that slight 12 dB per octave typically. So if you're going to half an octave, it's you know down six dB or something at, at your at your speaker crossover. So sometimes in my experience with measuring, it's it's a little better usually to try to go a little higher than your your okay. true you know your your true speaker's okay. rating. Sure. So Rusty, is that where your head was at on that? Yeah, yeah. that's what I was thinking. That you would want a little bit of that, uh, a little more overlap of mm-hmm. you're not if it if it's if it's spec to play down to 60, you would want it to be a little higher so that mm-hmm. set it at 80 or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I usually try to go a half an octave higher. So a doubling of a doubling of hertz is an octave. So 60 would be 120. So half of that would be 90. But it, but again, your headroom is so high on that speaker, it just might right. it just might not matter at all. But I also trust that, you know, Jeff's the guy that designed the speakers and the subwoofers in his room and and so if there was reason for that, I mean, it's just not what I was used to mm-hmm. or familiar with. So I was looking at, so I'm actually pulling up the Anthem on my phone and just seeing what Anthem used. So it's got the crossover set at 80 hertz for the front, 80 for the, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's got my surrounds at 130, in ceilings 120, back ceiling 130. But basically, the front three, the LCRs, they've got them set at 80. Changing that crossover point will sound very different, guys. If you haven't played with that, play with it on your own. Like uh, you know, adjust That's it. That's a great thing. Exactly. Tinker. You try it. See what it sounds. Cool. Don, appreciate the $5 Super Chat Home Theater. I'm sorry, Horizon Home Theater. So thanks for mentioning our little show, Home Theater Hub. Uh, So they're doing a podcast, weekly podcast, man. They're killing it. So I appreciate you guys and what you do for the community and uh, just a fun time over there. Uh, Let's see. Christian, appreciate the $5 Super Chat. He says, have you guys ever considered doing a video wall in your home theater, but with TVs with ultra thin bezels? So he's talking about kind of matrixing All right, look at our um, screen right now. We've got four people. Think of that as four 16 by 9 LCD TVs, real thin bezel in between. I wouldn't prefer that. Having that black line, I don't care how thin it is, that Mm -hmm. would drive me up the wall. Mm -hmm. Agreed. No time. I I want a solid screen. With the new micro LEDs, you don't see those lines unless you're really close to the screen. Uh, back at a, at a normal distance, nine feet, 10 foot, you're not going to see those. But yeah, I says, yeah, those lines would irritate me as well. For sure, man. Yeah, I don't. I don't These TVs keep getting now. bigger. Yeah. John. Uh, okay, cool. So this is, I couldn't remember if we addressed this one. John says, could you talk a little bit about where to begin for room treatments? Ivan, you mentioned it earlier. You want to elaborate on what is a first reflection point? Yeah, so your first reflection, you can figure this out with with the mirror trick um, because sound waves and light waves pretty much travel in the same path. So Mm -hmm. if you put the mirror on the wall, sit in your your main listening position and figure out where that mirror is where you can see your front speaker, whichever Mm -hmm. speaker is closest to the wall. And that's going to tell you where that sound is going to bounce off that wall. And controlling that first reflection is important because... If you control that one, it's going to eliminate all your second, third, and fourth reflections also. So it's going to con- control a lot of the extra echo in the room. Um, so that's where I started with the first and second reflections. Um, well, really, the first reflection off of the my front right speaker, which is for me, is right next to the wall. So literally, my, fr- my front um, sound panels are right next to my speaker. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the one over here on my side is really the first reflection off of my front left speaker. So those were the first two that I wanted to control. And then I treated the back wall um, to catch everything that was bouncing off of the back wall. So that's where I started anyways. Um, And then I wish I would have done the overhead panels sooner um, because that definitely 
yeah so that's a perfect picture so so the one in the front by the screen um you can't see the speaker that's there because of all the velvet but there's, there you go right there, you picture. right there you can see, yeah, on you the can right. see that that's where that front panel is mm -hmm. um because it's catching the reflection off of that front speaker um and then the second one is catching the reflection off of the left speaker um so that's that's where i started and again i would have started with the overheads a lot sooner than i did because that really did was a game changer as far as clearing up the the vocals and in, in movies and music and stuff i did when i was researching one time some, the the mirror trick i saw that you're supposed to actually according to one source i mean there's it's not like there's ever conflicting information about this stuff out there <laughs> yeah um but it said that if you're doing your first reflection, you should actually be trying to hit both your left and right speaker, and which will be two different places on your wall. Mm -hmm. um, and so it may mean uh, it depends on kind of how your your room geometry works out. So maybe you can get one acoustic treatment to cover both of those reflection points, but you may have to do more than one. Yeah. Like a whole wall, <laughs> Jonathan. Yeah, <laughs> let's make it big here. Jonathan's that's like, yeah, I did that whole wall over there. That's awesome. Yeah, well, that's yeah. exactly why. And interesting though, Jonathan doesn't have those are really kind of diffusion, right? They absorb and diffuse. They're three and a half inch foam, but they're thicker than like your typical acoustic foam. Like you, if you put your finger in them, they don't hardly move. So okay, where yeah. they're where they bevel in, they're almost just drywall, and where they're thick, they're absorption. So it gives you a like combo when you're when you're doing those seat positions, like what you're talking about for a single seat. It's easy to determine with a mirror trick, like where those points are. Mm -hmm. But how do you do that for them? And we talked about this, Michael, in the past. How do you do it for your how do you do it for each seat unless you just do the whole wall and when you do the whole wall now it just becomes almost two absorption so this is mm -hmm. kind of like a manipulation of those concepts that just kind of buffers it for each of the seats mm -hmm. and what ivan's done well with those panels that he's got is that's kind of the same sort of thing so it's got the right. wood for the reflection and the panel has the slots to go into the absorption for the absorption right. side so it's mm -hmm. it's the same concept just done in a different a different manner yeah, and, and um, I saw a comment here, SRW1000, although it's widely practiced, it's not always best to absorb the first reflection points. Check out one of the many Anthony Grimani podcasts for more detail. In my room, when I added the GIK panels, they're what Ivan has right here. So you can see they're, I call them combo panels. So they have mm -hmm. a slatted wood front baffle and there's holes in it like slats. And so some of the sound hits the wood and bounces off. That's reflective or dispersed. And then you have some of that goes inside those slats and gets absorbed inside the, the foam or the um, insulation on the inside. So when I first installed them, the room just seemed too lively to me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really like that. And so I removed, there's just four screws. I removed the panel off of my front two reflection or first reflection points. And I like that sound much better. Um, and I think you're right, though. Try it both ways if you're able to um, and see what sounds best in your room. So, but yeah, yeah so I, I've seen people put diffusion panels on those first ones as well. I'd like to mention that one of our guys in Kansas City had three technical kind of overviews, like initial sessions with a, like different acoustic companies, mm -hmm. how they would treat his room, like not, not to the nth degree. They were just yeah. given like an uh, initial right, with, right. A, with a price and saying, here's mm -hmm. the direction I would go. They're mm -hmm. all three dramatically different. And these are all professional <laughs> acoustics. That's crazy. They, they actually years. make the, the panels and they can't agree on where they're supposed to go. So, yeah. so yeah, the point being that there's going to be some subjectivity in here and what people like, and also just differences between what experts recommend. Um, so yeah, you got to play. Yep. And and I'll say this also, you mentioned taking the wood off of yours. I like the wood on mine, especially at that front one, because mm -hmm. my room is, is not uh, equally spaced. Everything is shifted to the right against the wall. So it, it makes it sound like that wall is further away with having those reflections mm -hmm. on that panel. Um, sure. The whole left side of my room is pretty much untreated. Right. So... Mm -hmm. Into Robinson says, uh, can Jonathan give an in-depth thought 
on why he prefers the AV-10 over the Storm and Trinov, considering one of them and would prefer the much cheaper option. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that, Jonathan? I know you've done some testing in your room. Sure. I had the Storm and Trinov compliments of Ryan letting me borrow them for a couple weeks in my room. There's there's nothing wrong with any of those processors. I, I think the daily driver functionality of the AV-10 is what won me over. Mm -hmm. So like the trend off, let's, let's put this out there. Yeah. Trend off is like the Holy grail on the forums, but it takes like five seconds to lock onto any Atmos signal. And that's not common knowledge. And I brought that up on the trend off forum saying like, all right, what am I doing wrong? There's probably a setting that's missing here because I'm missing the first five seconds of every song that I play on Dolby Atmos and it cuts in kind of abruptly. And this is, this is annoying. Right. Mm. And I listen to music constantly down here. Like that's my primary use of my theater actually with spatial mm. audio. And they're like, yeah, they, they actually, it wasn't even a, yeah, they got mad at me at first. Like stop trolling. Like How dare you? I'm not yeah. trolling. I don't know. I, I thought there's a setting missing. Like, no, that's the way the codec works. It has to do some sort of time alignment and that makes better lip sync and all this kind of stuff. And, and I was like, okay, I'm missing the first five that's seconds awesome. of my music. This is unacceptable to be on a 20,000. Yeah. $25,000, whatever processor. I'm not doing that. None of my receivers have missed the first few seconds of I've only had cheap stuff and it's never done this. What's going on here? Like my Onkyo didn't do that. Why does the trend out not do that? <laughs> that's flat out unacceptable to me, period. Like end of story. You guys fix that before I would mm -hmm. ever be interested in your product. So that's how strong I feel about that with trend off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, with storm, I like doing manual EQ. <clears throat> I didn't really think that Dirac did an improvement in my room. And if I'm being straight honest, I had a couple friends come over that were not, that came over later and they both told me my room had never sounded that bad that they could recall. So mm -hmm. Dirac didn't do anything positive for my room. It, it could be these speakers because they're unique and sure. Dirac's all about impulse control and perfect phase alignment and time alignment. These CBTs don't really have like a perfect impulse response because they're shaded. They're in a J shape. Mm -hmm. They're not like a single point source, like some of your speakers would be like if you had a coax or something like a single driver, it may have just kind of like messed up in that regard. Um, the guy who did the calibration for me on both cases, because, because mm -hmm. Ryan's got feet in the industry, the vendors in both cases calibrated my system remotely, it took them two or three hours each. So we did the trend off two or three hours. We did the storm two or three hours. Like it's not, these weren't amateur calibrations that they, they remoted in and did it. Um, I like manual EQ better than, better than what Dirac did. I didn't notice any like issues with the storm, except for it didn't have a remote, which kind of bothers me. Cause I, I use my AV 10 remote all the time. And so I had to, you know, log into my phone, unlock my screen every time I wanted to mess with it. That's not cool to me. Mm -hmm. So really at the end of the day, it just kind of came down to daily driver functionality. Also on screen GUI, there is none on the storm, none, period. Mm -hmm. And the trend off has like an on screen GUI that looks like it's from 20 years ago. So, like, to me, I felt like I, just being full honest here and probably mm -hmm. get some somebody stabbing me an eye on the forums for it. I would, I would take the AV10 if it was the more expensive option and not take the storm or the trend off mm -hmm. if it was a cheap option. You know, the, the AV-10 is a $7,000 retail and the other ones are 20 or 25. Yeah. Just being it personally from some time in, if the prices were reversed, I'd still recommend the AV-10. Like I, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's one of those things the emperor has no clothes. Honestly. I mean, that's just how I feel about it. Yeah. And we've talked about it for years. And Denon and Marantz are like bulletproof on, on the, yeah. <clears throat> the firmware. They don't have bugs. They don't have issues. We had an issue with one of those processors. The volume was just like cranking up to the very top. Like it would, it couldn't, we couldn't get it to stop. And, and one of the processors with the EQ that was supplied, my Ryan said is when we did the calibration, he said, one of your speakers is blown. And I said, uh, no, we haven't played it loud enough to do that. Yeah. Found out it wasn't. The calibration was that bad, you know, from one of the processors. So it's like, all right, you know, that's, that's my experience. Anyway, I'll probably hear about this on the forum. Someone will start a thread and see what, see what Jonathan said. I already started one. Don't worry about it. That's right. He's, just, he's over there fanning the flame while you're <clears> talking. <throat> well, I have the predecessor to the AV10 with the 8805A, and I love that thing. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's, it's easy. It sounds great. I have no problems with it. So that actually transitions into this one. So Neil says, Michael, how's that AVM 70 from Anthem? Does it have a permanent home? So he's asking me, am I upgrading to it or am I switching? So I have the Anthem AVM 70. I'm sorry. I have the Anthem AV7706 processor. And like Jonathan said, it is rock solid. I've never once had HDMI handshake issues. I've never once had any funkiness going on. I have had some funkiness with the AVM 70, you know, I'm not saying that it's, it's buggy, but it's not bug free. It's not, you know, um, and I, there are definitely some things that I'll share in the review that I really like about the AVM 70. Um, a lot of things really, I like about it. I still need to learn more about it in takes and take some measurements as well because I'm not getting the base response that I want in my room. And I know my room's challenging. I'm probably sitting in a null. Um, but Odyssey was able to, at least perceptually in what I'm feeling in my body, I feel it a lot more with Odyssey than I do with the uh, the Anthem. Anthem. And normally Anthem is pretty, like it tries to get a, people will tell you, they're like, oh yeah, Anthem is, it tries to give you a more accurate base response. Well, I don't want an accurate base response. A base response that makes me smile from ear to ear, you know. Um, and all the people say that, amen. And if that's not accurate, then so be it, you know, it's my room. Um, but don't take my joy from me, you know. So, and I've got the there's two settings in there, I forget what they're called, but it's kind of like a base boost, and I've got it up all as high as it'll go. Is at six? So, but I have not had a chance to really dive into it to figure out is there anything else I can do with that. I remember reviewing the um, MRX 11, I think 20 back in the day, about probably four or five years ago. And kind of the same thing. I felt like it sucked the life out of the base. And I even sent the file to Anthem. They tweaked the ARC file, sent it back to me. And it was better, but it still wasn't what I, I enjoyed. Um, and again, it, it, I know my room's challenging. Uh, I don't have enough depth to get my seats out of the you know, that room mode, but it's what I've got to work with. So, but no, it hasn't found a permanent home yet. Um, honestly, I, I'm with John. I want to check out the, um, the AV 10 and it may not be any different than what I've got now, the 7706. I don't know, but it would give me more options with direct. Uh, Neil put a comment in here on that. In that conversation. Like that what 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 product are you talking about, Neil? Was that the AVM seventy? AVM that you're saying? That's what I've got. It's the AVM seventy eight K. That's what I have. Well, I'm I'm asking Neil, um, and he'll have to comment again. Like, oh, is he okay. talking about that in relation to the AVM, or is he talking about that in relation to one of the? Boutique I think he's products? talking about. Yeah, Neil, just clarify if you don't mind. Um, if you had if you upgraded the ant because there was an Anthem AVM seventy. And then later on, I don't remember how long, but after that, they came out with an 8K version. And so people that had the AVM 70, I think they could send it in. They would upgrade that HDMI board to the 8K. And I believe that's what he's talking about. Neil, correct me if I'm wrong. And then Ike says he loves his AVM 70. Like I said, it's a fantastic processor, but it's not bug free, at least in what I'm experiencing in mine uh, with the NZ8 projector. When you say it's not bug free, Michael, <clears throat> what products besides the NZ8 are you using to say it's not bug free? Like, are you? So it like is still. It's going through a Mad VR, um, so the NV Extreme. So it could be something in that, but all I know is with the uh, Marantz AV7706, I don't have those hiccups. Mm -hmm. Does CEC? Does Ant Does Anthem have CEC? HDMI CEC? It may, but I don't have it enabled because I don't have anything CEC with a projector. See, that was another thing for me. I, I'm like rusty. I really enjoy CEC and I have it in my theater. And I think Ivan, you said you use it too. Like yep. One remote does it all with CEC because the Epson yep. supports it too. So even the projector and my amps, everything. Mm -hmm. At any rate, those boutique receivers don't have HDMI CEC mm -hmm. and right. Rance does. So to me, that was like another, like a little daily use yeah. thing. If, you know, if Anthem has it, I've, I've read a lot of good things about Anthem over the, over the years. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious if they're both. Yeah, so I, as far as, um, and I think I even took some notes um, on it. 
on some of the issues that I was having. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Yeah, here we go. Anthem AVM 70 review. Uh, da, 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 da. I switched from Apple TV to Kaleidoscape and I got no sound. And then I had to restart the Kaleidoscape to get that HDMI to sync back up. Um, I wrote HDMI handshake issues. I was watching Dune on Kaleidoscape. I noticed some flickering like in the, the picture. I hit pause and the screen would go black and then it would come back on. And I've even got a video clip on my phone somewhere. I need to download that before it gets lost. Um, and then I said, I, I wrote, had to turn the AVM 70 off and on to get the PS5 to sync. So I've had, it's mostly like HDMI syncing issues. So again, it could be, uh, you can turn off. Oh yeah. Um, does, yeah, it says it does have CEC. So I'd have to look and see in the Anthem. Now would, that wouldn't cause that though, right? I wouldn't think. No, it shouldn't cause the things you're talking about. Like CEC is more for power, not not for like black screens or weird blinking or anything like that. Yeah. It's just turning so them on. That was just issues that I had. Um, I'm using a Rui Pro, Rui Pro um, HDMI cables. So, and like I said, I the only thing I changed was the processor. Yeah, I mean, if you're not having those issues with the Marantz, mm -mm. that's nope, that's what we're problem. talking about with that rock. That rock star yeah. reliability you get with the NMR Yep. Uh, da, 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 da. Michael, appreciate the $2 super chat. Did he have a question or anything? No, I didn't see one. Oh, here it is. Yep, he does. Uh, does anyone have any experience? Let me pull that one up. He did have one. There's a couple down below. Anyone have any experience with KEF CI200 QL, specifically using them as LCRs? They seem to spec pretty close to the in wall THX. So I'm definitely not the Kef guy. I don't know much about them. Um, had pretty limited exposure to them. Any of you guys? I haven't heard Kef speakers in probably Been 15 years when I was doing the home theater work. Okay. So present, share a screen. We'll look at it together because I don't know it either. Yeah. But we can figure it out. Four hundred dollar retail. Um, how about some specs here? Ten hundred fifty watts, eight ohm, ninety dB sensitivity. Frequency response thirty five hertz with uh, basically in wall. Um, nine point. So it's probably an eight inch driver. Is that? what it is with the bezel around the end or something. I'm not sure that's kind of strange. Oh, that's the cutout dimensions. What's the product dimensions? Um, I don't know. So if you add 20 dB to that, if it's in wall directly overhead or close, you're probably going to be able to hit reference with it. Maybe not if it's farther away. Certainly not going to be doing this kind of frequency at reference, but... um. I don't know. When you start paying, you guys, what do you think about paying like five hundred dollars for a, a single in wall? Does that does that light your fire? Seems like a lot for. I don't That's know that I would. But I'm at. I don't know what what setup he's going into. So. Yeah. Um. Probably, probably, I don't know. I can't have any serious like complaints from it, from what I saw from the spec sheet, but I. But I think I might try to go a different route if I was going to spend five hundred dollars a speaker myself. Okay. If you had a good sale on them or something, maybe. Always pushing says, "How is the review of the Outlaw Monoblock coming along?" It actually came along very well. So go back to the channel; it's actually on the website. I don't have a comparison between that and the Basics A1. Um, I don't have that in for review. I think they sent me the um, A3, so that was a three channel. I actually like that amplifier. Um, I think it fit for a lot of people that are especially just trying to get into separates with, you know, it wasn't super expensive to, but I don't have any measurement equipment to test signal to noise ratio and actual power and things like that. But it, it sounded fine in my setup, but I don't have a direct comparison. Candid Sound says, is Apple TV the best streaming platform? Sound wise, I get the best sound from my Blu-ray. But for Netflix and Prime, what's the best way? 
I haven't seen any new studies on this. Have you? Have you? Have you guys seen any new tests on this? No, so I, I prefer my uh, my Apple over the Nvidia. I still got the Nvidia Shield in there, and I haven't touched it in over a year. Mm-hmm. I know um, Jeremy at Tech Enthusiasm did a lot of different comparisons of streaming services and quality, and he went pretty in depth. I can't remember if he compared. I can't remember if he was p- comparing devices or just different mm-hmm. applications on Apple TV. I think oh. it was just comparing different apps on Apple TV mm-hmm. or service provider, like like Disney Plus versus Apple Plus. Years ago, I, I remember seeing that. Uh, go ahead, Ivan. Sorry. I'm going to test. There's definitely differences between the different platforms. Mm-hmm. Like we were talking about the title versus uh, Apple Music earlier. There's a huge difference in those. Mm-hmm. So, but I, I couldn't say usability wise, I prefer the Apple over the NVIDIA. I didn't, don't, we never ran any tests as far as which one sounded better. Yeah. I, I years ago, I read an article that was talking about looking at examining bit rates, and Apple typically had the highest, even among like when you get the little movie codes, <clears throat> you know, and you download it and you pick your, your player or your carrier, you want to import it in the movies anywhere or you want to port, port it into iTunes. And I remember reading that iTunes at the time or that, that the Apple product had the higher bit rate that they delivered to customer, mm-hmm. but I don't, but that's been years ago. And I don't know if that's still that way. I haven't seen any articles on that recently. It's kind of hard. I, I think it's kind of hard to, to judge that without like a side by side. Yeah. Cause I don't think the differences are for video. I'm talking about for video. I kind of am getting to the point with for video, unless it's very dark, because they seem to crush detail and dark scenes on the compression with a lot of the streaming services. Mm-hmm. But unless it's very dark, I'm getting to the point where it's harder for me to tell the difference between like a 4K stream and a Blu-ray as far as video. And I can tell a difference in the audio because the compression's there, and the ba- specifically the bass is not as strong. I run my subs hot, and I can tell a difference in the bass. But video is not as easy for me to tell. Are you guys? Where do you fall out on that? Like if you're playing a Blu-ray versus a streaming service. Yeah, I'm I'm the same as you. On mm-hmm. the video, it's usually pretty darn good or good enough on streaming. Mm-hmm. Like I don't really have any complaints on it. Audio, I always feel like I'm missing lacking, out. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. is ironic to me because you would think that the video, the amount of data the in bandwidth. video is yeah. Yeah, the bandwidth. Thank you. Uh-huh. The bandwidth for video is much higher than it would be for audio. So absolutely. And, so, and I, I know the argument is that people have better TVs and they do yes. speakers. I think and that's, that's why they proportion it that way. But I'm like, well, maybe could we just like, you know, slide the scale a little bit more <laughs> back towards the audio? <laughs> yeah. 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 But we're in the minority. Mm-hmm. I agree. Unfortunately. Hi, Modula says Michael needs to make his way back to Wisconsin. We got more to show, baby. So that was my first home theater tour up there. So definitely, man, I'd love to do that. Um, actually, I, I think Tony was looking into it at one time. He asked me about that. So no, I'm I'm down to come back up again sometime. Um, I'd buy a ticket to go on that that trip. All right, yeah, you be my camera dude, man. I need a camera. You man. got it, man. Whatever, I'll That'd shine your shoes. I'll carry your I'll, suitcase. I don't, I don't even need that, man. <laughs> Whatever you I need, mind, I don't mind working hard. So honestly, even just a big help is moving my lights around. Yeah. Like while I'm doing B-roll, just man, if you could turn the light, that that always slows me down when I have to put down my camera, grab the light, move it around. And back then, when I did Tony's, he was so mad at me. It's a funny story. He's like, "Bro, you're so cheap." I'm like, what do you mean? He's like don't they sell a battery pack for these, you know, LCD lights? I'm like, yeah, but they're like a hundred bucks for two. I need four. So that's 200 bucks or something like that. Hey, like, golly, just buy them, man. Cause we're like stringing extension cords all over the place and having to unplug here and plug it over here. And he's like, dude, you could save so much time if they were battery pack. So I eventually bought the batteries. And, and yeah, you also bad. reminded him that it was not a sponsored uh, trip. I did. I'm like, look, dude, I mean, this is freebie. So I did the Kansas City tour. I didn't have a single sponsor. I did the Wisconsin, not a single sponsor. Uh, that was just literally me paying out of pocket. Jonathan was awesome, man. He let me stay with him and fed me and probably picked me up at the airport. I can't remember. I think you did. 
Um, I, don't, I don't remember if I did or not. I don't Somebody I picked you up, probably. Yeah. Was Ryan maybe? Did Ryan pick you up? No, because I didn't meet Ryan until I got to his house. That was the first time I think I'd met him. I might have. I don't remember. I don't see. All right, we both slept since then. I don't remember either. Um, but yeah, and Tony graciously opened up his home. I stayed with him. So that saved me a ton of money, but it was still, I was gone five days. You've got your flight. You've got, you know, some other small expenses leaving the, you know, car at the airport or whatever. But, um, but yeah, it's always nice if I can get a sponsor or a couple sponsors doing a trip like that. But yeah, man, I'm definitely down to, I'd love to come back up. You guys are awesome up there. Got some really cool home theaters too. Uh, we can add a hundred mile per hour boat ride to the Ooh. itinerary. Don't <laughs> there fall you off. go. Heck yeah, man. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm GoPro for that. Rusty's yeah. like, this trip's getting better and better, baby. Yeah. Hey, this is, this would be like the old days of like GoPro youth man or what was it? Yeah, it was GoPro youth man. Yeah. <laughs> I did, man. Oh, that gee. Was my, that was my, yeah. If you guys have been around for six years, I was, I'd introduce my videos. I'd be like, what's up, guys? Or no, I always said, what's up, YouTube? Why am I talking to YouTube? I'm talking to people that are watching it on YouTube. But I'm like, what's up, YouTube? GoPro Youth Man here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so embarrassing. Uh, Jason says, that's why y'all have a following. Y'all are relatable without forgetting where you come from. I appreciate that, man. And that's the thing, man. We we know where we came from. And, and here, here's the truth, though. If for whatever reason... I had to go back to where I started, I would be okay. You know, my stuff doesn't define me. My theater room doesn't define me. My speakers, subwoofers, single digits, none of that defines me. Um, I would still enjoy it. Like, I mean, I've got a, a really, I say simple, just a two channel set up in the living room. You know, now it's 2.1, but you know, I could have some inexpensive speakers I bought off Craigslist and I would enjoy that, you know, so. Jonathan, how'd you find out about JTR? JTR brought a subwoofer to our 2011 subwoofer meet and just rocked it. That's <laughs> how I found out about it. Nice. Like Jeff came to 2011 and 2012 in my house with the brown ceilings that you saw. And uh, the two, the JTR, we had SVS there in the 2011 one. We had um, Epic Empire, I think. We had a Season Submersive. We had like all the big subs of the day and JTR was kind of like kind of kind of just new on the scene, really. I mean, he did commercial audio and pro audio stuff for a long time, but he's kind of breaking into the home theater market, if I recall mm -hmm. correctly, around 2011. And that sub, I mean, that JTR Captivator just dominated, dominated. Mm -hmm. And like the, the, the slot port on the bottom made all this wind come over my tile floor. Like right. when you played like some of the really low stuff. It was below port tune. It's a lot of that's a lot of wind that some people say shouldn't be there. I don't care. It was awesome. Right. <laughs> it was like blowing in people's faces and an explosions came that much more live and it just destroyed everything. So right after that meet, I was like, I can't afford two of these. They're still expensive, even you know, back then. Yeah. So I said, I'll get the next best thing. Like my probably my other favorite in the meet was the SBS PB 13 Ultra mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. it, I knew it wasn't on the level, but it was something I could afford. And there was a guy that a guy in the meet decided he was going to buy something and he had a couple of the PB 13. So I bought two of those and I put them up and I remember thinking like, gosh, dang it. <laughs> two of these aren't even anywhere near what one of those JTRs was. Yeah. So then I didn't, I didn't have those very long at all. And I sold them and I bought the two JTRs. So you saw in my photo set, that was the two subs. I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> That's how I was introduced to JTR. You guys come to M wave. You'll experience JTR. It's pretty wild because Jeff's wild. bringing in, What's he bringing? Eight? I think we're up to 8. 4,000 Captivator? Something silly. I think, I think he's bringing eight. So that'll be 16 eight teams in his room. Yeah. And even, it, and even then, it'll be incredibly impressive. And if you keep in mind, you bring that into a home theater space that's not 60 foot by 40 foot with 20 foot ceilings. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. it just scales unbelievably. Yeah. All right, last couple of questions tonight. Jerry says, I want to thank Jonathan last week. He mentioned the slick deals on the RP 1600SW and one arrived Wednesday, and it is truly awesome. Does Good. a great job. That's fantastic, man. That was a great deal on that sub. 
Holy cow. Is and we had that there? we had that last um last year at M Wave. We actually Ryan bought one and brought it to the show and, and doing blind testing. It was out of the non JTR and non GL or G S audio. Yeah. GSG. Um, GSG. I know I wasn't saying it right. GSG had dual 21s. JTR had a single 18. And this kind of pretty much came in third place. That's saying a lot. So it was pretty wild. So are you looking it up, Jonathan? I'm trying to see if it's still on sale. Uh, I'm on I'm on slick deals and I don't see the thread anymore. So it might be gone. I had to search for what did I search for? You told me something. I don't think it was clips. It definitely wasn't RP. If I searched for RP or reference premiere, it didn't pull it up. I there found some, it. Clip subwoofer pulls it up. Okay. And I'm going to add a Rama right now. It's still on sale. 1049. That's pretty much an unbeatable price for that thing, I think. On Adorama? But Adorama. you got to go through the Slick Deals link. That's right. They have a so referral have link. Some of the captivators on there. And he says, <laughs> uh, Neil 8 says the 14-inch version is only $699. Mm-hmm. So instead of uh, the um, the 16-inch version. So definitely some good deals out there, man. Last couple here. Uh, High Modulus says, speaking of calling out, how are we guys not joining the roast of the Tecton guy? Yeah, I mean, that's... I don't really have anything extra to say about it. We just wanted to bring attention to it because I felt that it was unfair. Um, and if you go and watch Aaron's revised review of that, he just shares all the what Aaron's always called as receipts. Um, and these are just emails straight from the company. So it was a, it's an unfortunate situation. It didn't have to end that way. It could have been a lot different and handled a lot better. Um but hopefully Aaron's able to move on and Amir, I, I haven't even looked at the ASR thread. That thing was like 40 pages long and man, it, it was just Aaron's was video. That part too was, it was a really good kind of just overview and explainer. And it's kind of yeah. crazy because it was like a big, he made a big stink about what seemed to be a pretty good review. So yeah. it, and a very confusing. small problem. Yeah, yeah. Like 150 hertz was just like a little tiny blip. Yeah, yeah. It, it would have been a non-issue if it had mm -hmm. been left alone. Yeah, but sadly, it was some things that were being said on his channel. He came out with two other videos, mm -hmm. and the videos were saying, "Hey, we're not suing anybody." And then, as soon as Aaron posted his videos, and it said, uh, "If you don't take this down like right now, immediately tomorrow, we're going. You know, I'll be seeking litigation." When you look up any rational, normal human being definition of litigation, that means I'm taking you to court and there's potentially a lawsuit. So, and he tried to explain that it was just, you know, litigation in his mind is just a couple lawyers sitting down, kind of like with a cup of coffee, having a nice chat. And that is not, it That's doesn't not matter what you think. Them. Yeah, right. it's not what you think. And then the emails did not. They didn't drive that. with wet at all. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the only so, time I've seen lawyers having a nice chat is when they're talking about their Ferraris. Yeah. And so he, he ended up pulling both of those. I haven't, again, I haven't looked at the channel since, but he pulled both of those videos. Cause now you got his video is being contradicted with what Aaron shared in his. And so with evidence, said, not just, not just, mm -hmm. he said, she said with evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. man, it was Aaron did a great job on that video. If you haven't watched he that, did. Video, do watch I think that. he handled it very professionally. He mm -hmm. wasn't like saying you suck and it wasn't a bash. It was like, look, I'm just sharing the, the evidence. This is what went down. This is how I feel like this is I've lost sleep. I'm losing weight over this. This is a, this is a mess and it shouldn't be this way. So um, I just definitely applaud Aaron. He did a tremendous job and hopefully Aaron, if you're watching or if you hear this later on, hope you had a good time at Expona. So I know he went there and I just told him, I said, man, put the phone down for a while. Just go enjoy some music. So he's a good dude. Last question of the night. Joel says, uh, does anyone have or know of good tutorials on how to interpret a spectrogram, uh, waterfalls, and impulse response? There's a ton of tutorials on aligning subs using mini DSP, but not this. Great question, and that is not one I can answer for sure. Those are, I don't even know how to read them. No, I wish I knew a good resource for it. I don't know that a good resource for that. In fact... You can find little piecemeal pieces of this on the forum, 
-hmm. But the guys that really know this well are in this as a career and they'd be happy to kind of like come over and do this for me, do this for you, but they're not really out there on the forum sharing their knowledge. So very specifically, you'll find some information on waterfalls. You'll find some times on like RT60s, which is like impulse, uh, like decay in your room, you know, impulse response as far as like how to use a piece, sort of particular piece of software. You'll find some people discussing things like that, but I don't, I'm, I'm sure they exist maybe somewhere in some forms buried, but I haven't found any like top to bottom. This is the overview, you know, like you can find for REW measurements or something like that. They just, that kind of stuff is, is kind of far enough into it that it's, it's not, mm-hmm. it's not popular enough to really get those big guides. And, and even like our knowledge on here, we're not going to pretend that we're some sort of, you know, Floyd tool, you know, we, we understand the basics of some of these concepts, but we're, oh, not, you, we're not in that level. Oh, brother, you win the internet tonight. I love it. There's a whole song about don't go chasing <laughs> waterfalls. I like it. That's a good one, Bruce. That's awesome. Great way to end it, man. <laughs> well, cool, guys. We've had a blast. Ivan, thank you so much, man, for hey, joining thanks us. Thanks for having me. Out. Certainly appreciate you. I dropped a link to Ivan's uh, home theater in the chat. Rusty, appreciate you dropping the link to the contest. We still have three days. You guys have an opportunity to win a general admission plus three home theater experiences for M-Wave. So head over to the MidwestAVExperience.com slash contest. Submit your 90 second or less video. We'll be, uh, I think this Wednesday at midnight is when the contest ends. And then our team will be looking over those and we'll, um, select a winner and we'll announce that winner next Sunday. Speaking of next Sunday, let me make sure, but I believe we'll have Dirac, um, the founder of Dirac. If I can pull up calendar, here we go. So no, do, 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 do. here we go. I was in a different, yes. So the 21st we'll have Dirac, um, and I don't think I put his name on here. His name is Matthias. So he's going to be on here and maybe somebody else from his team. But we're going to have a great time talking about Dirac, diving into it. And uh, they even offered to um, possibly bring me out to, I got to remember where they're at. Is it Sweden? Somebody let me know in the chat. Where's Dirac at? Like their headquarters. I'm forgetting where it's at. But anyway, so that'd be a cool like trip. What's that? I, I think it's either Sweden or Switzerland, and I always confuse the two. I think it was Sweden. I Sweden think. is yeah. what it says on a Google search. I didn't know, but okay. I... Yeah, so I might be able to make a trip out there sometime and kind of tour Dirac headquarters and have some fun and interview those guys. And So I'm excited to have them on here. So think about your questions next week. We won't do the typical probably home theater questions but it'll be directed to direct. So if you got some direct questions, man, next week is going to be the week uh, to get those answered. So I have no idea who Ned is, but anyway, guys, I hope I'll have a great week. Um, check out all the details on the website and we'll catch you. What's that? Um, was laughing at the Ned comment. <laughs> someone said someone, the Ned comment is catching the Ned of this. He meant end. Oh, so, I, got I don't you. know who Ned is. Yeah, Ned? Nobody knew who that was. Hey, appreciate it on episode 100. So, been awesome over the past two years doing the podcast with you hopefully we provide value to you so hit the like button on the way out and we'll catch you next week